Okay. Good afternoon. No, not yet. We're waiting for the TV to go on. Good. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for everybody for your patience and your travel over to the 250. It's a busy day here at City Council with a number of votes, and so uh, we are we're going to get started. And as we as will note that we've just been joined by uh, Council Member and Chair of the Hospitals Committee, Carlina Rivera, and Council Member and Chair of the Mental Health Committee, Diana Ella, is on her way. Oh, oh, sweetie. Oh my God. I will never, ever pay. I'll be paying for that forever. We're also joined by Councilmember Cabrera, Councilmember Alan Mizell, Councilmember Bob Holden, and we'll be joined by many more. We were earlier joined by Councilmember Van Bramer as well. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to administration for being here. I'll keep my, uh, my opening statement short just because we are already running behind time. Um, just two years ago, uh, health and hospitals, or a little over two, uh, H&H &H took over the operation of the correctional health services in the city's jail system. The hope was that that would help change and improve the condition of services and quality of care delivered to the incarcerated individuals with the support of the Department of Correction. Progress has been made, we believe, but I continue to hear about ongoing issues and problems that we want to help resolve. Um, we have heard from the Board of Corrections that over a fifth of all medical services for incarcerated individuals scheduled in the latter half of 2017 were not completed. We've also heard certain months where those numbers have been higher. Um, those are factors contributing to that. Um, can be sometimes difficult to solve, like lockdowns of ho housing units for safety reasons, but we still believe that should not hinder the department from making improvements where it can and where it must. We know that many incarcerated individuals enter the correctional system with behavior and mental health conditions, including mental illness and substance abuse, which oftentimes are rooted in trauma, but we must ensure that this system supports the needs of those who are incarcerated rather than adding to the trauma. Uh, today, this hearing with the, the other committees that are here is an opportunity to hear more information about how the Department of Health has improved over, uh, over prior operators, what progress has been made, what issues related to access, delivering quality, can we work together to improve, and how the council can build on that work to ensure better health care. We'll hear a bill today, that's uh, my bill along with Council Member Carlene Rivera, which aims to ensure that any health care provider contracting with the Department of Health and Mental Health provide health care services, provide health services to an incarcerated individual, and that the, but that they, that they collect and report data on sick calls. This bill, inspired by the uh, Board of Corrections recommendation, will ensure that correctional health staff, not just correction staff, are doing triage and making sure that medical appointments are kept. We will also be hearing my resolution 581, calling on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign uh, Senate Bill 8673 and Assembly Bill 8774 to require that state correctional facilities provide incarcerated individuals with access to, method, uh, to methadone, uh, naltrexone, uh, and, and others for the duration of their incarceration. Uh, the city has done work in this area of addressing drug addiction. We want to make sure the state also does the same. Uh, I want to thank my staff and the committee staff here for helping to put this hearing together. I want to thank the administration for being here and their ongoing work in this area of all the agencies represented. Um, with that being said, I will now hand it over to Chair of the Hospitals Committee and my colleague to the west and the south, Carlene Rivera. Thank you, Chair Powers. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Carlina Rivera, the chair of the New York City Council Committee on Hospitals, and I'd just like to start off by thanking my colleagues, Councilmember Powers, who's the chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice, and of course, Diana Ayala, chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, for this joint hearing uh, today, and of course, to all of you for being here. I want to welcome members of the committee who are here, um, including Councilmember Maisel. Thank you for being here. Today we'll be hearing testimony from the agencies charged with providing correctional health services in our city's jails. As my colleague Councilmember Powers noted, our committees are concerned by the level of access to health services available in our correctional facilities, and we want answers as to why, according to a recent report by the Board of Corrections, only 67% of scheduled medical appointments actually result in patients being seen by a physician or a healthcare provider. 
We also want to better understand how the Department of Corrections and Correctional Health Services identify and track requests for health services to ensure that incarcerated individuals requesting medical services outside of the context of intake procedures are able to schedule appointments with correctional health services and are able to make those appointments. Ensuring that incarcerated individuals have access to health services is critical, but we must also ensure that the health services they receive are of high quality and address their needs. This is why the council passed Local Law 58 in 2015. Local Law 58 requires that the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which under the city's charter is responsible for correctional health services, to issue a quarterly report that includes any physical or mental health performance indicators reported to them by any healthcare provider in city jails and covers five area indicators of health services. Intake follow-up care, patient safety, preventable hospitalizations, and preventable errors in medical care. H&H &H currently submits these reports to the mayor and council on a quarterly basis. However, while the first report issued under this legislation provided details regarding the metrics used to assess each indicator and total 22 pages, these reports now provide very few details and are only one to two pages long. This continues a troubling pattern with regards to the difficulty of obtaining relevant information from H&H &H in various contexts, including during the budget process. The committees look forward to examining this and other correctional health reporting requirements and would also like to explore the continuity of care individuals receive when they are released from incarceration. incarceration. This city has a responsibility to ensure that individuals in its care, including those in correctional facilities, receive quality health care services. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now we will hear from uh, the fantastic chair and council member, Diana Ayala. That kind of makes it up. <laughs> Bear with me. I have new glasses and I can barely see, so I have to do this. Uh, some of you will understand. Thank you, Chairs Powers, uh, Powers and Chair Rivera. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction, and I would like to thank all of you for being here today. In 2015, it was announced healthcare management and administration of healthcare services for incarcerated individuals at the Department of Corrections would be transferred from a private contractor to the Public Benefit Corporation Health and Hospitals. While this transfer was enacted to create better co uh, continuity of care, as well as the integration of physical and behavioral health services, there still remain gaps in service provision that we hope to address today. We know that over 21% of the incarcerated individuals in New York City jails have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder, and out of 21%, 11% of those individuals were found to have serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, according to the DOC, city jails, including Rikers Island, now house more, more mental health patients than all hospitals in New York City. It is our responsibility to make sure that incarcerated individuals who need behavioral health care are able to access it in a timely manner. While we recognize that this is challenge, a challenging population to serve, we must ensure that all individuals, including those with behavioral health care needs and disabilities, are provided with the appropriate health care treatment that they need by well-trained trauma-informed staff in accordance with the law. We look forward to hearing from all of the stakeholders here in today, today in order to work towards building a better system for incarcerated individuals and the people who work with them. I would like to thank committee staff, Council Sarah, Zara uh, List, Policy Analyst Christy uh, Dwyer, finance, finance Analyst Jeanette Murrow, and my Chief of Staff, Millie Bonilla, and Legislative Director, Bianca Almedina, for making this hearing possible. Finally, I would like to recognize committee members that have joined us. Fernando Cabrera, did you recognize everybody? Mm -hmm. Bob Holden? Okay, and no need to do that. Look forward to hearing from you all today. Great, thank you. And so with that, we will administer the oath and uh, by committee council. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great, thank you. Do you want to begin testimony? Just if you can introduce yourself before you start. Sure. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Zayala Powers and Rivera. 
um, uh, and members of the committees on mental health, disabilities, and addiction, on criminal justice, and on hospitals. I'm Patsy Yang. I'm the Senior Vice President of Health and Hospitals in charge of Correctional Health Services. I'm joined here by a lot of our team. Um, to my right, it, Patrick Alberts. He's our Assistant Vice President for Policy and Planning. Uh, Ross McDonald, who's our Chief Medical Officer. Veronica Lewin, who is our Director for Communications and Public Affairs. And Carlos Castellanos, who's our Chief Operating Officer. Um, the Department of Correction, our, our, our partner, is also here represented by a number of people, and I know that, that we're going to pull them up to the table after, after this testimony. Um, and I, I wanted to say on behalf of Dr. Mitchell Katz, our president and CEO, we all appreciate your inviting us to speak with you today about this and, and your support of our work. Um, we share with you our, the, your concerns about access and quality of care, and they are the reason we exist. Um, so. Um, just as an overview, uh, New York City Health and Hospitals Correctional Health Services, we call ourselves CHS for short. Um, we operate one of the largest correctional health systems in the country um, with over 43,000 admissions per year and an average daily population of about 8,900 people across 11 jails in the city. We provide health care services from pre-arraignment through discharge, including medical, mental health services, substance use, treatment, dental care, social work services, discharge planning, and re-entry services. CHS is an essential partner in New York City's criminal justice reform efforts. We believe that we have the unique opportunity to cushion the impact of incarceration and that we have the responsibility to address the health care needs of our patients to better prepare them to leave jail and not come back. Um, it's through this lens that we pursue our work of increasing access to quality medical care for people while they're in custody of the city and as they rejoin their communities. Since we moved over to New York City Health and Hospitals in August of 2015, We've rebuilt um, the framework uh, of our systems and we've changed the culture and the way we deliver services. We've reduced our reliance by 80% on private contractors. We've replaced private contractors with CHS staff and with service arrangements with health and hospitals facilities. This has resulted in higher quality, greater accountability, and greater efficiency. Our move to health and hospitals also really greatly boosted our ability to attract highly qualified staff, clinicians, administrators, everybody, um, who share our commitment to high quality care as a human right. Um, in becoming the direct provider of health care, we underwent major reorganization to improve supervision and support of staff at every level and every capacity within our division. This restructuring was implemented in every clinical and administrative department, whether it was creating an independent office of quality management that reports directly to me, um, or consolidating all our substance use treatment services and programs under the leadership of mental health and, and Dr. McDonald. Um, we've also implemented new ways of delivering care to make sure that our patients get the health care that they need when they need it. In collaboration with Department of Correction, we've increased access to health care in jails by cohorting patients with similar medical diagnoses into discrete housing areas, often with a matched uh, satellite clinic. This could be mental health patients, people with substance use disorders, um, or certain chronic medical conditions. Um, this model brings our services closer to where the patients actually are and reduces the need for escorts to clinic. Given the comprehensiveness of our intake assessments and the high quality of our clinical work, we know who needs to be seen and when, and we work daily with DOC to ensure that our patients get the care and the medications that they need. At the same time, we continue to um, see a high volume of sick call encounters, in part due to the higher standard held by the New York City Board of Correction compared to other large city systems. We also follow through and investigate to conclusion every single patient complaint or concern that we receive from our patients or their representatives. As part of the health and hospital system, we successfully leveraged the resources of this, lo this largest and oldest public health care delivery system in the nation. Um, and that's all towards improving the health care of our patients under our care, both before, during, and after incarceration. We became the sole and direct correctional health service provider. Um, and since doing that uh, in 2016, uh, we asked for and were approved and funded for a five-year plan to improve our services, expand things that work, and, and try, try new, new approaches. Um, I'm just going to go through a snapshot of some of the milestones that we reached in less than three years, in, in about the two so or so years that we've been here. Um, we've more than quadrupled the number of patients initiating hepatitis C treatment in jail. Um, in fiscal year 2018 so far, we've got almost 160 patients who were initiated on this cure, um, compared to 28 in fiscal year 16. While we run the nation's oldest and largest jail-based opioid treatment program, we nearly doubled the number of patients in our program since just last year, tripled the number of patients in our program since just last year. 
Um, last month, we had over 1,000 patients either on methadone or buprenorphine on any given day. Um, uh, since December of 16, um, we've reached our, recently reached our 4,000 uh, target of group sessions um, that are part of the Creative Arts Therapy Program, which is one of the largest programs of its kind in the nation. Um, and just last month, we celebrated the opening of yet our, no our annual art show in, in Chelsea um, in coordination with the School for Visual Arts. We've distributed almost um, 11,000 naloxone kits to members of the public who come to Rikers to visit um, members of their family and their loved ones and in the borough jail since the launch of Healing NYC in March of 2017. We've expanded to a total of six specialized housing units for patients with serious mental illness. This program for accelerating clinical effectiveness, or PACE, is something that I think every, everyone in council has heard about and, and visited. Um, and it's demonstrated its efficacy in increasing medication adherence, reducing incidence of injury and self-harm, and lowering uses of force. We were the first in the health and hospital system to establish a telehealth program for patient provider encounters. Um, this is really to enhance access to specialty services both on and off island. Um, it now includes multiple specialty services at Bellevue and at Elmhurst for our male and female patients, respectively. We also use telehealth to do assessments for post-acute placements of our patients at Kohler, a long-term care, um, post-acute care facility of health and hospitals. And we do consultations at increasing pace um, in among our jail facilities. Following the success in Manhattan, where we, ex we have extended our enhanced pre-arraignment screening unit, or EPASU, into Brooklyn. Um, we just did that recently. Um, EPASU allows us to better identify and respond to acute medical and mental health issues. We avoid preventable runs to the ED, which disrupts case processing in the courts. Um, and we've been able to get, with patient consent, provide uh, defense attorneys and the courts with clinical summaries that can help support alternatives to incarceration. Um, of the 82,000 screenings since the, the Manhattan operation went 24-7, um, emergency, ro emergency room runs were avoided by 27%, and almost 3,000 clinical summaries were provided to defense counsel. Um, in an e effort to improve the quality and timeliness of court-ordered psychiatric competency evaluations, we, CHS, volunteered to consolidate um, the citywide uh, clinics that were previously operated by Bellevue and Kings County. Um, we believe it was closer aligned with our mission and that we can bring that closer to the city's uh, larger criminal justice reform efforts. In partnership with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the courts, prosecution, and defense bar we launched a pilot program at the Queens facility of the, of the psychiatric evaluation clinic. Um, and the goal here of the pilot was to complete court-ordered evaluations for defendants from um, an average of 43 days citywide to, seven, to within seven and 14 business days for misdemeanors and felonies, respectively. Um, in the five months, almost five months, since we went live in Queens, um, we have met or exceeded our goal in most of those cases with an average completion time of misdemeanor and felony reports completed within nine and 11 business days, respectively. As part of New York City First Lady Shirley McRae's Women's in Rikers initiative, we established the Healthy Lifestyle Therapies Program. It's a wellness initiative um, that promotes healthy coping skills for stress and trauma um, through different modalities, in including exercise, cognitive therapy, acupuncture, and guided meditation. We also launched a program to provide counseling, safety planning, and referrals to community resources upon discharge for women who have experienced intimate partner violence uh, before being incarcerated. To address the, new unique, the unique needs of young people, we began conducting high-quality screenings of every young person entering the jail, regardless of his or her medical he health history. This has allowed us to identify people who, to, with whom we can connect um, with services both in jail and upon reentry for planning. We also created the Geriatric and Complex Ser Care Service. This is the first and only jail-based program of its type in the country. Um, the service provides integrated clinical care, court advocacy, and reentry planning to the oldest and most vulnerable of our patients. Thanks to Thrive NYC, we received successive funding to implement a series of initiatives to address mental health and substance use issues among youth who are incarcerated. We've enhanced our programming uh, for mental health programming for youth by offering comprehensive services, including psychiatric assessments, creative arts programming, harm reduction, substance use engagement, and discharge planning. These enhancements allow us to better serve a population where intellectual di disability, new onset of mental illness, and substance use are, are overrepresented and exposure to trauma is ubiquitous. We currently also screen patients for neurodevelopmental impairments um, during intake. Uh, 
we, this year we started asking every individual who enters jail whether they've ever had involvement with the Office of Persons with Developmental Disabilities, the state OPDD office. Um, with this new question, we've been able to identify the rate of identifying people with neurodevelopmental disorders or disabilities from about two-thirds of 1% to 3%, and this we expect to refine and continue to hone, hone this process of screening. This allows us to um, connect people with services while they're in jail as well as for reentry. Um, and we actually uh, dedicated a PACE unit, one of the PACE units that I talked about a little bit earlier, to individuals who are suspected or confirmed with neurodevelopmental disorders. Reentry and planning discharge services are as important or, uh, in terms of, uh, of the service that we provide in jail to have people be released to the community, back to their communities, and not return to jail. Um, to prepare our patients, um, we've revamped our discharge planning services throughout the system um, to maximize every touch and to optimize every impact um, that we have with our patients while they're in custody. We defined a core set of services that every discharge planning service and discipline would, would include, and, uh, and we're coordinating all of that so we're not doing multiple visits but actually extending our reach with the, with the resources that we have. Um, we are making sure that all our patients have health insurance upon release. Um, we were focusing initially on the 55% of patients who come into jail with active Medicaid um, to make sure that their, their Medicaid is reactivated um, when they get released. And we've more recently focused on the 45% who don't. Um, and we re uh, last year, well, earlier this year, um, initiated a pilot at AMKCR largest intake male jail. And this summer, extent fall extended to the women's jail, um, a pilot that we are undertaking to offer Medicaid application assistance within the first 24 hours of, of intake. Um, we're monitoring that to see what, what we can do with, with our resources to continue to do that and expand it to all the jails. Um, as of September of 2018, um, a total of 603 patients received an application intake that was an average of about 65 patients a month. In addition, in addition to Medicaid application, uh, we've been growing the reach of our discharge planning services to more patients with medical needs. So whether our patient has HIV AIDS, is an older person with complex medical needs, or somebody who is needing to complete his or her treatment and, and cure from hepatitis C in the community, we're working to link the, pa the patient to a care provider in the community, notably um, leveraging all the service capacity in the health and hospital system. Uh, we offer discharge plans to all patients in the mental health service. Every patient with a mental health diagnosis is counseled on what is included in his or her discharge plan. Um, and in partnership with Empower Assist Care, or EAC, we've created the Community Reentry Assistance Network, a unified provider system that has increased efficiency, allows for increased oversight of service delivery, and allows us to be more responsive to patients' changing needs before and after release. In addition, um, as part of our programming under Thrive NYC, we offer discharge planning for young patients, which includes care coordination across city agencies, providing referrals to court advocacy, and transitional planning for youth 18 to 21 years of age. We've also expanded our comprehensive discharge planning services to the Substance Use Reentry Enhancement Program, that's SURE, um, that which involves every, to include, make sure that any patient who has a substance use disorder who's not already receiving the service does get court services, harm reduction counseling, Medicaid screening, and application assistance, and reentry planning. We also, also began prescribing, um, e-prescribing naloxone um, so that patients um, who are discharged are trained before discharge, and when they, they enter reenter the community, they can pick up naloxone and use that, um, keep that on, the, on their person. Um, additionally, we uh, our patients, uh, I think there was about eight or 900 patients in the each month since we've done sure who have been discharged. I'm, I'm just about done. So um, as the city embarks on its ambitious plan to create a smaller, safer, and more fair correctional system over the next decade, CHS continues to be a critical partner in planning, the f that the f in planning what that future system will look like and how the delivery of quality health care can be improved. We are committed to uphold our ethical obligation to improve the health of our patients and prepare them to live a healthy life when they rejoin their communities. We're grateful for the unwavering support of Mayor Bill de Blasio, the New York City Health and Hospitals Board, New York City Health and Hospitals President and CEO, Mitch Katz. Um, and we again thank you for your support and, our, and your interest in our work. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. Is, sure. is DOC, test you te DOC is testifying too? Not, you're here to ask questions too? Okay. So thank you for that. So we, um, but we may w ask you to come up and take the oath as well if there's, if there's questions for it. Um, I'm going to do a couple questions and I'll, I'll hand it to the chairs and we'll 
so we'll go from there. I know we have a lot of members coming and going. So just just generally um, on the uh, as you guys have taken over, you've been there for two years. You have you outlined a pretty pretty robust list of new pilot programs, new programs put in place. One of the things I'm was looking for or would ask is generally how you're measuring yourself, not just in sort of in, in terms of new programs, but totally recognize the importance of that, especially around the drug treatment and things like reentry services and connection to care, because that we're gonna I think talk a lot about that. But even just in terms of metrics around delivering care while in custody. Can you talk to us about how you measure yourself in terms of that regard and then how we would as a city and a city council measure performance relative to somebody who has been there, you know, your prior, you know, who h and essentially replaced, um, and how we would measure in terms of delivery of care to people? Because, you know, we cited some stats here around people missing appointments um, and for some reasonable reasons and some others. So can you just talk to us about generally how you would measure yourself in terms of performance and how we would be viewing the last two years in terms of performance to the those who are incarcerated? Sure. I, 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 can, I can start um, if I can. Um, <laughs> since moving to health and hospitals, we have actually grown and made more robust our quality assurance and improvement processes. Health and hospitals as a, the largest and the oldest um, healthcare delivery system, highly regulated, has a, an extremely robust structure for quality assurance. It, it reports directly to the board. There's a committee um, to whom we report on a regular basis. Um, there's a ton of metrics um, and, and that we report to the board. Um, there's also a number of reports that, this is external reporting, that we report to the board of correction um, in addition to, to, to council. Internally, um, where I think the real change occurs um, is not only what we've done um, in terms of supervisory structure and support, everything from the, the performance of an individual clinician, um, everything from chart reviews, um, errors, complaints, education, training, to including the frontline providers in every aspect of our quality assurance program. So we also have within health and within health and hospitals a quality improvement structure, and within CHS we have a parallel one. Um, it all reports directly to me. It's a, it's a complex committee structure um, covering every discipline, um, not just the clinical disciplines, because we think the operational aspects are cr critical for to uh, the work that we do. Um, there are a number of I, I don't even know how many hundreds of, of metrics that we we keep. Um, but they cross all aspects of performance, whether it's quality, uh, time and you know time and attendance, uh, uh, supervision, state of art, uh, CLE, CME. Um, and can you do you mind sharing with us just just generally? I think those are some key metrics you said would be things you like just in terms of performance. How two years later we're doing in terms of any of those time and attendance, quality of care, outcomes, a any any. Any data you can share with us in terms of where, where we are today versus two years ago? Um, yeah, I, you know, the, the it's been a, a real shift. The uh, chairperson over there has referenced earlier to, to what LL58 looked like the first time when it was under DOHMH um, and Corizon. Um, they were numerous metrics that were uh, more adversarial, more, more it, it was a, an external contractor whose performance was being uh, very microscopically examined um, to, to see where something would go wrong, rather than a more supportive, open, opaque, you know, we don't want mistakes to be hidden. We want them to be reported so that we can correct them, we can understand them, we can see if it's systemic or whether we can see it's an individual. And either way, we'll correct those. Um, so that the, the, the feel and the culture of that is a significant change. I, I appreciate that, and and thank and thanks, Spencer. Uh, and the and, and I understand the structural changes between a contractor and an agency have have benefits. Um, and the and can you talk about um, any ways you guys are using like sort of data to to measure outcomes and how how you're doing that? Yeah, I think both Dr. McDonald, who's our CMO, and and Mr. Alberts, who actually manages all the data um, and the reporting, um, which we which we centralize so that we have. Better, better consistency, standard reporting, um, and more in-depth analysis um, is under Mr. Albert Schatz over there. 
Sure. So um, we have a very robust system of, of quality improvement. Um, and really what we've sought to do since the transition to health and hospitals is to engage the frontline staff around choosing metrics that are meaningful and being part of the process of quality improvement. So they're often around specific clinical issues that our clinical staff along with our clinical leadership in the facilities have identified um, and will do performance improvement projects to address a particular indicator. I think you know, one of the th challenges and one of the things that we've thought very deeply about is the importance of measuring care, but also a balance there. Um, uh, if you recall, many of the indicators in, under the previous contract often looked good. Um, and with the appropriate systems in place, any metric within me medicine can, can creep its way up. I think much of what we've attended to since the transition is a little more nuanced. It's about caring about the patients. It's about doing the right thing for the patient in front of you. Um, a lot of this is captured in our morbi morbidity and mortality review process, which we spend a lot of effort on, uh, to really think deeply about our systems of care delivery, how people communicate, uh, and how they work together. Um, so there's a, there's a robust program, and it's, it's um, really more from the ground up than it ever was before, um, as Dr. Yang mentioned. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that many of the things that were so critical for us to change uh, are, are not easy to, s to put a metric on, and we'd acknowledge that as well. Got it. I'll come back to some of that. Um, but thank, thanks for the answer. Uh, I want to talk intake. So when somebody comes into custody, can you just give us a sort of uh, a walkthrough of the process from sort of initial custody to receiving the initial screening, what intake looks like for somebody who comes into custody, what that process looks both from the DOC and from the H&H uh, &H, uh, standpoint? Sure. Um, so I'm going to uh, pick it up at the H&H &H, uh, level. So, well, I should probably start in pre-arraignment. So increasingly in two boroughs we have now uh, CHS staff in pre-arraignment. So that means when uh, patients are still in NYPD custody, they'll be evaluated by nursing staff who have access to our correctional health record. So if anyone has been in the jails before, we will have information about their medical history and background, and we have a screening that more effectively decides who should go to the hospital uh, and also gives us a heads up for anybody who's coming to the jails. Um, so we can kind of pre-alert the jail intake staff that this person is coming with this particular problem. Um, inside the jails, DOC has an intake process that they do, um, which occurs in different locations in each facility. Um, and every uh, intake facility has a clinic that operates 24-7. One of the things that's unique about the New York City jail system is that we do a full history and physical on, on intake up front. Um, and that's done by a physician assistant, a doctor, or a nurse practitioner. Um, that's a much more robust level of intake screening than most jails around the country uh, do historically. Um, and it allows us to really um, start off on the right foot in identifying chronic disease, uh, in identifying undiagnosed disease. So that's where we do universal HIV rapid screening. Uh, it's where we're moving towards universal hepatitis C rapid screening. Uh, it's where we do testing like quantiferon testing, which allows us to protect our patients and our staff against the transmission of tuberculosis. Uh, we screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia for all women and all men under 35. Um, and we screen for a litany of chronic diseases that we know to be common in our patient population including, critically, uh, acute withdrawal. Um, and we know that about 18% uh, of our patients are in acute opioid withdrawal at the point of admission. Um, and we have clinical staff there to begin their treatment right at the point of intake. So we can treat withdrawal upfront uh, and alleviate the suffering associated with that condition for our patients, whereas in most jail systems, there's no possibility to do that at that point. Those clinicians will also set the trajectory for future care. So they make referrals to specialty services. They have a, 
a triage that refers people to mental health, and it may, it may warrant a stat mental health encounter at that time. Uh, and they also uh, arrange for follow-up visits. So they'll schedule follow-up encounters in the electronic health record uh, so that we uh, can track those patients moving forward. Yep, thank you. And I just wanted to know we were joined by Councilman Lansman and Councilman Moy as well. Um, I think that's somebody else. Uh, um, so what just when that screening happens, that initial screening you're describing with the number of well, long list of uh, things that you're looking for and, and, and trying to provide services for. What is the time, how long before somebody, I know Brooklyn and Manhattan have sort of the pre-screening process. How long before somebody, how long when somebody is in custody do they receive that screening? Like what is the time period between, maybe on average, between sort of coming into the custody of DOC and then seeing somebody from your H&H &H staff? So that screening always happens prior to a person being housed in the jail system, uh, and the standard is 24 hours, as I understand it, from D the point of DOC custody to housing the person. That's the rule, right? What's the average? I, I was curious. I think the rules, I have to see with the 24 hours. Are there, is there a population that's not receiving uh, screenings within 24 hours? So maybe any information then? Yusuf? Thanks. We'll just have to ask you to take the, the oath as well. And, and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. If you could raise your, if you could raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond on, honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. So introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks. Faisal Youssef. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Health Affairs, New York City Department of Corrections. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. Um, so I guess the question is, um, so, some data on, I, I think it's a Board of Corrections rule around 24 hours to see, to receive an initial screening from, uh, from, uh, from CHS. Is, can you give us any data on average time between when somebody comes in and gets that initial screening, how often perhaps somebody doesn't receive it within 24 hours, or maybe the answer is 100%. Um, any, any information you can share with us on, on, on meeting that 24 hour? So first regulation? of all, I would say that we, in most cases, patients are seen within the 24 hours. They're very unusual, very, very unusual. I don't have the data offhand as to the exact time, uh, the average that someone gets to see medical but I can tell you that it's all done within the 24-hour time frame. That so you so 100% within 24, I know you're under oath, and so I'll yes. be careful what you say, but you're saying high, high compliance with the 24-hour regulation. You, sh you can share with us maybe data after the hearing on what the average time is? We can. Is that, that a fair, is that a fair? We'll try to, yes. Uh, but, the, but the high compliance part with 24 hours? Yes. And that's from the second that they that's before they're housed, they get the initial screening, and that is when they are within DOC custody, is that correct? Well, every patient before they're housed must be seen by medical right. first. And, and then the, the housing is determined after. And on the pre-screening, why were Manhattan, Manhattan so I think was first, Brooklyn was second, Can, any information why those were the first choices? It, it was really lo logistics, it's the readiness yeah. of the facilities. Um, and the capacity of the facilities. Okay. Uh, so, and, and these are plans to expand that to other? Yes. yes. Other boroughs? Can any, Queen, any information Queen, on timeline Queens for that? Queens will be next, and then the Bronx. Queens and the Bronx. Yeah. Any timeline for doing that? Queens, we're hoping uh, this year, later this year, at the end of this year. Um, and Bronx, um, we're, we're, there's some space and facility issues that we've got to iron out, so that'll be sometime next year. Okay. Thank you. And, um, <coughs> The what happens if before they're housed and haven't been screened, if there are a need for medication, treatment, service? What happens in that period of time if there is something sort of imminent? Or I know pre-screening might help to determine that, but in places where there isn't pre-screening, what happens in that sort of gap period, especially if it's upwards towards 24 hours? Sure. So. Um, it's important to remember that in all of the New York City jails, our staff are ready to respond to emergencies 24-7. Um, so, um, and, and it is not unusual to respond to emergencies uh, in, the, in the intake area. 
So really anyone who had an acute complaint that, that was of concern, uh, the DOC staff in that area could activate an emergency response and our staff would actually report to the intake to evaluate the person at that moment. And drug treatment, like if somebody needs? So uh, drug treatment is available through the, at, at the, um, uh, at the intake pro point. Um, our clinical staff have learned um, over the years that that should be the first question we ask. Um, so when we observe that somebody's in acute withdrawal, we'll often address that with them, uh, get everything set up for them to get a dose of methadone or buprenorphine, and then we find that we can get to the rest of the conversation more comfortably from that point. So we try to front load that as much as possible. Okay, I have follow up questions, but, I, but I'll, in the sake of time, I'm just gonna go through one more category and then I'll give it to the other chairs. Um, we have the bill on sick call. I, I know it's, it's new bill, we won't ask it in time and on it. We will wait, await feedback on some of it. I just wanted to ask general questions though. Can you just give us information on the process today if you uh, are, are incarcerated and want to do sick call, can you walk us through that process for how that happens, how, how somebody, I think it's a form or paper, how, and then what the process is for getting to you? Yes, so uh, normally sick call is offered Monday through Friday, except for weekends and holidays. So the general process is that there is a list a Wait, can I say it's offered Monday to Friday except weekends and holidays? Right, and I'll so get and I'll differentiate what happens on those days for you. So that's routine sick call I'm talking about. So in a, every day a list is posted in each housing area. Any inmate that wants to go to sick call the next day signs up on that list. At the end of the evening tour, that list is removed by the outgoing officer, and is actually taken to our control room where they actually make copies of that list and actually gives copies to uh, our clinical staff, uh, uniform staff. The next morning, that uh, the, the officers will end up using that list <coughs> to call each uh, housing areas for those inmates that sign up for sick call. However, you have inmates that sign up for sick call that don't necessarily show up for sick call, on, and that's a choice of their own. You have a second section, a se sector of inmates who never signed up but still come to sick call. So the list does not really, is not the bottom line for any, everyone uh, for sick call. You can sign up and go, and if you don't sign up, you can still also go to sick call on a daily basis. Okay, <laughs> so what about evenings and weekends, et cetera? So you're in a housing area, you're not feeling well, you still have access to come to the clinic on the, those off tours. So the officer will call the clinic and they will notify the clinic. The inmate will be either escorted or sent on his own, depending, to the clinic for sick call. So the bottom line is, is that inmates have access to the clinic 24 seven. But there still seems to be a difference because you are, I mean, you even noted in your comment that there's a difference between Monday and Friday, weekends and holidays. Well, so what is, so I'm still unclear what that difference is. So, the, so we classify those as emergency sick calls. So you, in the days when routine sick calls are not being offered, as I said, for the evenings, weekends, et cetera, those are termed emergency sick calls, which they come to the clinic. Why not offer seven days a week and holidays and everything else? I don't get to choose when I get sick. I'm... It's a holiday, I'm sick. Um, weekend, I'm, I mean, why not have it available all the time in the same way? So, um, I, I would, uh, part of the answer is the board standard says that, um, we, uh, except for weekends and holidays. Uh, but I think from a clinical standpoint, the key is that we need to be able to address urgent clinical issues 24 seven. And we are able to do that through emergency response. Um, sick call really should be for more mundane, run-of-the-mill type complaints um, that really were best staffed, just like a regular outpatient clinic, were best staffed to, to handle during the, during the normal work week. And what would qualify as a run-of-the-mill? So dry skin is a very common, low back pain is one of the most common. Uh, when we look at the sorts of complaints uh, around sick call, those tend to be at the top of the list. Okay, and um, and and you when uh, you're the, at the Department of Corrections, correct? Yes. So 
you're you're managing this process. You're in charge of the healthcare. Is that correct? Yes. So why is why is that? Why does DOC manage this list when you're the healthcare? I mean, it seems like you sh- shouldn't the healthcare provider be in charge of managing the list and and appointments. So I think it's a reflection of the of the board standard, um, which is uh, I think it's important to say really the the most robust. Uh, mandate for access to care that I'm aware of in the country. Um, And really what the board standard says, the way we interpret it, is that anyone who wants to come to sick call on the days that it's offered is allowed to come to sick call. So there really is no triage process to decide who can come to the clinic. Most systems across the country do a written process where someone will sign up, request a sick call, and that piece of paper will usually go directly to the clinical service. The clinical service typically has 24 hours to process that and to decide if the person's going to be seen and when they're going to be seen. So in contrast to most systems, we as the health service don't decide who comes to the clinic. The standard is that everyone can come to the clinic. Uh, And for that reason, um, it's not useful to us to have a list of people who may have indicated that they wanted sick call but aren't presented to the clinic because our only response to that would be bring them to the clinic if they still want to come. To be fair, that sounds like it, it sounds like a system problem. Like you don't need a list. People, anybody can come. So you have a list that people sign up, but people can still come, which is different than other places. Not, not the answer to the question about why one agency manages versus the other. I mean, so, uh, unless, I mi- unless I'm missing something. So, so uh, my, my, my interpretation of that is is that Um, In New York City, unlike other large city um, correctional health systems, that sick, the request for a sick call is not clinically triaged. There's no clinical eyes on it that says, yes, you should, yes, you're urgent, no, you're not urgent, or we can fix this up something some other way. The requirement in the city is if you want sick call, DOC brings you. So it's, it's not who's managing, it's, it's not, nobody's supposed to be triaging here. If you want sick call and you ask for it, DOC brings you to us. And so, uh, good segue, thank you. Um, uh, we are, can, can you tell us what percentage of people in, under your numbers that request sick call are seen? We had some data, that I, I made my opening statement, but we're happy to hear with, if you have different numbers. So I don't have the data to tell you exactly what numbers actually sign up. But as I said before, uh, everyone that requested sick call, you know, whether they sign up or not, are allowed to come to sick call. Uh, um, I understand that, but m- you know, there's no information on how many requests versus how many people are seen. And you have no, nothing to share. I think even the, the BOC reports have some of that. I think we have some data to share with us. For sick call, yes, we do have some data, which I could probably share with you at a later time, which I don't have with me right now, um, that I do track in my division. But uh, it's separate from scheduled visits. We had an, The number I think we had cited was uh, about a fifth. I'm uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, about a fifth, about 20% had, um, had uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, had not, um, well, let, let me move to non-completion. And, um, and, and which is, uh, so uh, reasons for non-completion from the stats we have, these are uh, for the first six months of this year, rescheduled 16%, uh, left before seen 2.1%, non-produced by Department of Corrections 63.8%, and out to court 17.8%. Do those numbers sound mm-hmm. correct to you? Okay, so you're talking about something completely different. Yeah, moving now, I'm talking yes. about So uh, that is actually scheduled visits you're referring to. Yes. Which, which is different from sick call. Schedule visits. Right, okay, right. Yes. Well, let's actually, let's go back to sick call then. I would, we would appreciate data on the um, uh, request versus scene as well. Do you think you can share with us after the hearing? I could get that data for you. Okay. Yes. So I would just mention also, if I may, um, so we've looked at the utilization, um, and we know that um, sick call is used, that we provide a lot of sick call visits. <laughs> Um, so some ballpark numbers of the people who stay for more than a month, uh, about 78% of them access sick call at least once. Of those people who choose to access sick call, um, uh, about a quarter of them access it five or more times during their stay. 
Um, and when we look at the people who use sick call the most, we have very high utilizers. So there are people who come to sick call more than the number of weekdays in the month. Um, so we do have those ways of knowing that we're providing a lot of sick call encounters. Also, when we talk to our colleagues around the country, other large urban jail systems, about the pros and cons of, of their system versus ours, uh, we do find that we have uh, more encounters than they do. And importantly, our, since our encounters are not triaged, our encounters are with physician assistants or doctors, whereas most of this work is done by nurses in other settings. Um, so we think it's it's fairly safe. And, and I understand, I think, to your point, was that people can show up or sign up. So saying how many are seen uh, relative to that is hard to say because people just show up. But right. any, any data you can share with us in terms of how many people are signing up and, and being seen would be helpful. Um, to non-completion of scheduled visits, uh, which is, and I'll, I'll hand it off after this, um, non-produced by DOC, it's an extremely high category. I think we could talk about all the other ones, court and conflicts with court dates, uh, rescheduled and reasons for that, and we understand. But ca can you share with us, not produced by DOC seems incredibly vague to me. Well, can you uh, share with us w w in, in data that maybe fall under that category and why? one would fall into that 66 or 64 percent, depending on the time period? Sure. So first and foremost, we work every day with H&H &H to ensure that all those scheduled inmates are produced for their appointments. Out of all folks, I think I have a very good appreciation of the importance of getting patients for their scheduled appointments. On a daily basis, when we get that list from my colleagues in, on h and H, those lists are reviewed continuously throughout the day by our uniform staff that works in the clinic, along with the clinical staff, to make sure that those patients are produced, and in most cases, to try to prioritize those most important patients that need to come to the clinic. In most of our facilities on the island, you know, there are different clinics, different facilities. All those clinics, I would say to you, are, have their own unique issues and problems. So, on a day-to-day -day basis, we will be there. When I say we, the Health Affairs Division staff will meet with our h and colleagues in addressing those issues. The production issues, and if there are frontline issues that needs to be addressed, we do it in a very timely manner. And I will tell you, and I can say this very uh, confidently at this point, the production rate has gotten much, much better. I don't have the data to support at this point here, but based on my interactions and our uh, dealings with H&H, &H, we do a very good, we, we're doing much better in terms of producing patients for their scheduled appointments. Maybe, maybe more bluntly, can you share any data that would be, you know, maybe more specific data on the not scheduled by, not produced by DOC? I mean, that, again, that seems like a vague, a vague categorization of, of non-completion, and we're hoping maybe we could get a, a clearer sense of what are the reasons or causes why somebody wouldn't be produced. I will check and see if we have that data, and if we do have that data, I'll be more than happy to share that with you. I, I would appreciate that. I mean, I would hope that you guys would have come with some some reflection of that because it's it's a extremely generic category and could result into any it could be a lockdown or it could be something or you know something that we would cause more concern and we would we would certainly like to see that we will we will follow up with you on that um can you describe discrepancies between different jails in terms of why there are different completion rates at different jails it seems like some have large gaps between each other and and completion rates so i'm glad you're asking that question so you take a facility such as AMKC, which is our largest mm -hmm. facility on the island, it has the most uh, diverse number of services that must be, that are delivered in that facility. Initially, we had one clinic where that most of those services were expected to, uh, all the patients were expected to, to be produced. Uh, that it's by itself, the physical plant limitation was, in, was an issue and still was an issue, is an issue. So within the last couple of months, we've worked very closely with health and hospitals where we open a, uh, what we term is Southside Mini Clinic, where, which is a, a clinic that is in close proximity to where the inmates are housed. 
so now the inmates could be seen it very quickly and returned to their housing area. So that by itself improved the access to care by just opening that one mini clinic in AMKC. We're in the process right now of looking of opening an additional mini clinic, which we term the Northside Mini Clinic. And again, the concept is the same, just to take the service closer to where the inmates are housed. And we feel by doing that, we will actually improve the production and access. We looked at other facilities, and I'll give you GMDC, and uh, not GMDC, GRBC and MDC, where we felt that we needed to extend the hours of operation beyond the day tour in terms of providing certain services. We worked very, very closely with uh, Melton Hospitals, where we both added additional staffing on the off tour to actually continue services to those patients. Uh, in some facilities, in the evening tour, where we did not have uh, adequate supervision, the department has ad added clinic captains so that they could supervise the clinic officers, coordinate the delivery of uh, services, and coordinate the production of patients to the clinic. So those are just a few things that we've done that have actually made a ma significant difference in terms of producing patients for their services. So, and on the plant limitations, is that mostly a security issue and staffing Pardon? issue? When you said the plant limitations, uh, or the plant, the physical, physical plant, rather, plant. Sorry. Um, is that is that around safety and security? Is that around staffing, or what is the what are the limitations in terms of a big jail? The size of the clinic. The let's let's use the MKC as a good example. We're the holding area where patients come in, into the clinic for their services. Only could have hold about fifteen or twenty patients tops in the clinic. Taking it into consideration the large number of inmates housed in the MKC that require services, that is simply not adequate. So that is what I meant by physical plant limitation. Okay, and I'm gonna ask one last question and then I'll hand it off. Um, just in terms of 19% of mental health services not completed because of rescheduling, CHS I think reschedules the appointment if I'm correct. Um, can, you dry, can you tell us the need to, is something you have answered to some people, but can you talk to about the need to reschedule that? Also, um, I think it's 17% is the number I have that are not completed because patients are out to court. Um, and just wondering why appointments would be, uh, can be scheduled to conflict with court dates and if there's a way that we can improve that. So as I said previously, we, this is a work in progress. We have been working very closely with h, &H to ensure uh, delivery of patients to the uh, mental health on a daily basis. Um, I would say to you that, you know, just as we did for, sick, for uh, scheduled follow-ups, the same is true for mental health where the clinical staff and the uh, uniform staff review those lists on a daily basis just to make sure that the priority patients are being seen and making sure that the ones that they really want to get seen can, are produced and to work through issues that they may have in terms of production on those days. Sorry. So I, I can, um, not the court issue, but the question about mental mental health. Um, one of the main reasons why we, CHS, would reschedule uh, more on mental health is because the uh, to establish and maintain the provider-patient relationship is paramount. Um, it Less so medical, um, that where you could see the, the available provider, um, but to see your psychiatrist and your psychologist. So, so the specific staff are versus the available. It's continuity and quality. And on the court dates, do you as CHS have access to the inmate management system, which would have I think we would have their information about their court dates. And if th if that if that is the case, is there a reason why court dates and appointments would be scheduled over each other? So for many of our patients that are detainees, sometimes we do not know the court date in advance when CH CHS makes that appointment. So that's a typical example when. Uh, the appointment, the inmate has a court date that we don't know in advance where you may find a conflict. And is there ever an attempt to reschedule it? Is, that, is there a way to flag that it's then been scheduled and to reschedule immediately? Yeah, so that part of the process is critical. And I just want to point out that, you know, this is a constant effort to try to get the right people into the clinic in the right time frames. And so on any given day when we don't get somebody, you know, that's a feature of any clinic I've ever worked in. There's a certain no-show rate 
And the key to good healthcare delivery is having good systems to make sure that those people are getting the care that they need. So if you didn't see them today, you have to respond to that and try to see them tomorrow. It, with regard to court in particular, some types of court visits are more knowable to us than others. Um, and I would also point out that a lot of times we're actually able to catch people after they come back from court. Um, so I would caution against um, scheduling practices that might make those numbers look a little bit better. But if there's a 10% chance we can catch somebody after court, then I still would like our staff to go ahead and schedule that encounter and give it a shot. I, I appreciate it. I understand the need to provide quality and that numbers don't always train, you know, probably, but also numbers do, do help us understand Certainly. stuff that's happening. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for the answers. I'm going to hand it over to Chair Rivera. Thank you, Chair Powers. So you mentioned that for the sick call process, if you didn't sign up, um, you can still show up. What is that process like? Or in terms of being able to go and seek medical attention. Okay, so let's use a good, a weekday for example, where uh, they sign up for sick call. So the officer goes to the housing area and they announce sick call. So everyone in that list who knew they sign up, some may, may decide to go, some may not decide, decide not to go. <coughs> so those who decide to go that sign up will go to the clinic for sick call. If an inmate did not sign up and then go to the office and I want to go to sick call, even though he or she did not sign up, that officer will also escort that and bring that uh, inmate to the clinic for sick call. I just wanted to make sure that whether it was in theory or in practice. So if, if you show up, can, can you be turned away? Will everyone be seen? You're not turned away once you get once you go to the officer. And, and CHS mentioned that they, they don't triage. So is it the Department of Corrections that, that does the triage? We do not triage. So what are some of the reasons, again, um, and Chair Powers alluded to this, what are some of the reasons that DOC would not be able to present an individual to CHS for a scheduled medical appointment? Now we have our own data and our own reasons, but I'd like to hear from you I know you don't have the data per se, which again is a consistent issue that I have whenever I sit across the table from H and H. But um, do you track these events? Of the reasons why they are not produced? Yes. I will go back. I think we do have some. I can't see that offhand. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about structure and reporting. Uh, which I mentioned in my opening testimony. Can you describe the contractual relationship between H&H, &H, DOHMH, and the Physician Affiliate Group of New York PAGNI in terms of the correctional healthcare services? Sure. Um, also, if I could just go back to that other question where you had indicated that you have a, an issue with getting data um, from he health and hospitals. Uh, we have so much data, and I, I'm not aware that we were withholding it from you, but... I, I didn't say that withholding. I think the transparency is okay. sometimes an issue with H&H, &H, and I've said that in every hearing, and I, and I think that you all come to the table and you're honest and you care about what you do, and I have tremendous respect. However, and I'm gonna ask you about reporting in a minute, when you initially see a report from 2015 that's 22 pages long that is detailed and itemized and allows us to be better council members and oversee an agency like H&H, &H, and then you get a one-page report like this very, very recently, you start asking questions about how mutually respectful the relationship is. And so I want the next few years um, to be a partnership. Yes, and so, so that's why I'm bringing it up. And so um, why this hearing is so important to us is because of healthcare services for incarcerated individuals. And I know there are multiple partners involved. So if you could just kind of describe that relationship. Yes, sorry, I'll go back no, to No, no, it's okay. Question, I appreciate question. you asking. Um, the, in the city charter um, leaves the responsibility for correctional health services with DOHMH. Um, when the decision was made in 2015 to transfer CHS and correctional health services from DOHMH to health and hospitals, um, there was a, an agreement that was writ written and signed um, by multiple city agencies, including city law department, um, correction, health, health and mental hygiene, health and hospitals, that transferred that responsibility from 
DOHMH to health and hospitals. So that's that's the two the that that level, um, and so we uh, do not report to DOHMH for for correctional health services. Um, we have that responsibility delegated to us. Our relationship with PAGNI um, is is uh, as a medical affiliate for hiring the frontline staff, clinical staff, whom we determine we want as part of our service. This was um, a decision that was made as part of the 2015 negotiations and discussions that enabled um, health and hospitals to maintain continuity of care and no disruption of service during this transition, first of all, from DOHMH to health and hospitals with the known imminent transition of Corizon out of the picture. Um, so uh, some of this, the, the core levels of staffing who were at Corizon, um, that sort of staffing model, we did select people, some select, we did not select all. Um, those are the people who are hired onto PAGNI's payroll. PAGNI, as an independent medical affiliate, gives us a little bit more flexibility in terms of salary um, and, and both um, terms and conditions of hiring and employment. So who's ultimately responsible for overseeing, monitoring, supervising the, uh, the correctional health care process? And what kind of safeguards are in place to ensure efficient oversight? So we are, um, and Health and Hospitals Board, um, and Health and Hospitals <coughs> President and CEO, um, through me, I, I am accountable to them. Um, and we, that, that includes what, what happens with PAGNI. One of the, the things that we've made sure to build into the PAGNI contract, which is a, is a little different um, from the other affiliation agreements with, with Health and Hospitals, is that um, all leadership, all management is with us. Um, there are no chiefs of service that are in PAGNI. They're all with health and hospitals. We make the clinical decisions, we make the hiring decisions, we make the firing decisions. We had, um, we insisted on a higher, on a very high level of fiscal accountability. Um, we get daily, bi-weekly payroll runs from PAGNI, which we review and monthly reconcile um, so that we know who's working, what their hours are, we actually manage their time and attendance and NHR and labor, mm -hmm. so we know that we're actually getting the service that we are paying for. <laughs> so um, looking at the report, there are the current reporting they, that's under Local Law 58, as we mentioned, and includes indicators, but there's no real information in, in what I showed you very, very briefly, and I, I know you're very aware of, of that report. Um, does the report currently provide enough information to ascertain the general health of patients in your correctional facilities? There, I, there's, there's more that we can report to you. There's, um, for example, as I mentioned earlier, we have numerous reports that, that are public um, that go to the, the Board of Correction. Um, it's, a, it's specifically called various, various cuts of as, as access reports, healthcare access reports. Um, do you, uh, there's additional data that you have that's not shared in these reports? Do you think that some additional measures could be taken? Yeah, I, <coughs> it's just talking about some of the, the data that we share right now. So um, we have uh, electronic health record. We were one of the first jails to put that in place. It gives us access to this incredible amount of information about our patients. Um, and I think it's probably a serve kind of the basis for a lot of the changes that we've made in the service. Um, with um, with data sharing and correctional health, um, my division was essentially put together to ensure that there was continuity with the way that we talked about um, the services we were deliver that we were delivering, um, that um, our partners understood the type of services we were delivering, um, and one of the kind of a culmination of that, um, in partnership with uh, DOC and the Board of Correction, um, is the Access Report, which provides this unprecedented look at service delivery, which is encounter based um, in the New York City jail system. Uh, it's 26 pages, goes every month, um, and it is sent to the council um, as well as the Board of Correction, and it's, it's posted on their um, website. So this was done in partnership with them, really um, kind of to serve um, as a, um, a really transparent view in how we deliver services in the jail. Um, kind of highlights some of the issues that we need to work on and, and the successes. Um, there aren't a lot of health care providers like us and none that I know of like us that, that provide this level of detail. So benchmarking 
what we do is, is a little difficult, but we, we, we've provided this data for long enough now so that um, I think uh, the public um, has a good understanding of, of kind of what's going on in the jail. Um, we, um, we certainly can provide more information. So um, going back to your question in, in the local law, um, the, the report that Horizon um, was producing and that, that, we were, that the DOHMH was passing along to the council was a contractually based um, report. It's kind of, a ki uh, kind of a sticks and carrot way to manage an outside provider um, with monetary penalties. Um, and it was not a quality based approach to healthcare like we have now. Um, so, so in terms of systems, I think the systems are much better. Um, doesn't call for that type of report anymore. Um, but we have um, information we could talk to you about, um, kind of about the report that we share now. I know that Agent H, you said in your testimony the the report was a microscopic view of where something would go wrong. Um, but you know, I think that. Uh, more details are, are better than not. And so I, I, I ask, um, in terms of people with chronic conditions, for example, someone with diabetes or um, issues that you know they'll need repeated care, do you have information on the number of individuals, incarcerated individuals with chronic illnesses? Yes. Yeah. And you have what kind of treatment they receive through the year? So uh, yes, absolutely. Um, that type of quality of care information uh, reports up to the Health and Hospitals Board under the same kind of reporting structure that hospitals have. Um, and much of it is in the realm of, of clinical quality assurance. Um, and there's a structure for us to report that to the Health and Hospitals Board and ultimately to our uh, CEO, Mitch Katz. In terms of, of pregnant women and, and mothers who are incarcerated, what sort what sort of support is provided for them? Uh, so we have uh, robust services uh, for prenatal care. Um, we have a full time obstetrician, uh, as well as dedicated support staff who work on issues of transitional care, um, and uh, also clinical education about uh, motherhood. Um, and preparation for uh, the process of motherhood. So when, um, if, if someone's a new mother and they are breastfeeding or specifically I'm concerned about pumping. So we heard of an example where an incarcerated individual was not given <coughs> access to a breast pump when she needed it and so it ultimately resulted in surgery to remove cysts that formed in her breast. Um, for women like this who need to pump, what is the process for requesting access to pumps, both pre-arraignment and while incarcerated? So um, we have uh, uh, extensive equipment in, in, the, in the Rose M. Singer Center in the women's facility. Um, we have a number of breast pumps available um, and a process in place and policy that promotes uh, uh, breast pumping and, and breastfeeding. Um, I uh, could give m you know more details on that. I'm not familiar with the case that you're citing. We'll be sure to send you some info. What about process for gaining access to the nursery? What are some of the pitfalls in that process? So any uh, inmate that comes into the system uh, that needs to go into the nursery, there is an application process that that uh, inmate uh, has to complete, which is then reviewed uh, internally within the facility, and then the determination is made based on the uh, findings and criteria that is outlined for that admission. How do the mothers or the women get to know about the process? At intake, there is a uh, notification of uh, nursery services available. Um, and of course, H&H &H has uh, uh, services in the clinic that will actually educate that uh, inmate of the different services that are available to them in the facility. And, and what about the, the breast pump? What, what exactly is the process if you need one? 
So they're available in the infirmary. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the nursery. Um, and they would be available to nursing mothers as well um, who did not have a, a child in the nursery. Um, and that would be through the clinic. So I want to ask well, just one last question before I turn it over to Councilmember Ayala. And it's about when, unfortunately, when things do go wrong and there are deaths on, on Rikers Island specifically. So February 2018, uh, the State Commission of Correction, they released a report entitled The Worst Offenders. It's probably where the most problematic local correctional facilities of New York State. And they included a review of inmate mortality cases, um, and some of those instances were attributed to deficient medical care. Uh, they, uh, deficient medical care, substandard mental health services, or inadequate custody and supervision by security staff. So how specifically has CHS address the issues of deficient medical care and substandard mental health services? Um, I, I have to familiarize myself again with that report. It's been a while, but I believe, I recall that most, if not all of those cases were under Corizon um, when, it, when the program was still with the OHMH. Um, <coughs> that, along with other issues and concerns and considerations led to uh, the mayor's decision that Correctional Health Services should be moved from DOHMH to Health and Hospitals and that Corizon's contract should be allowed to expire. Well, there's two that I want to bring up, um, and I'm going to say their names because they at least deserve that, but, uh, and also to tell you what they died from. So Wayne Henderson died in 2017 from untreated seizures. That was in the New York Post. And then just recently, this month, Cheeky McLean, this was in the Daily News, died after collapsing while playing basketball and complaining of pain. Are you familiar with those cases? Is there a lack of personnel at the Department of Correction at CHS? Do you think you're delivering the most top quality care to the people in your facilities? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I am not able to speak about specific cases. As a physician, there are HIPAA. Uh, rules, both laws and, and ethical reasons that I can't get into any details of specific cases. Um, what I can say is that we have, we have an excellent clinical staff, um, and since the transition, we have recruited and retained amazing staff who are absolutely devoted to healthcare for vulnerable populations, to this work of healthcare in the jails, and to minimizing bad outcomes in any way that we can. Um, and I think that we have had both success that we can point to in making the systems of care delivery much safer uh, over those years, uh, as well as a process in place to, to look at every bad outcome and make sure that we learn everything we possibly can from it and use anything that goes wrong to continue to improve. Um, S some of some bad outcomes in jail are, are not preventable, um, but we hold ourselves to a very high standard, and we look for any areas where we could have done something differently in every case. And 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 I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Um, I understand those to be those two cases sounded preventable, um, and I know that you also mentioned in your testimony you. Uh, are held to a very high standard held by the New York City Board of Corrections compared to other large city systems. And so, you know, you touted a number of accomplishments and, and we appreciate the, the update. And so we ask that to reflect that and some of the things that do go wrong, which are bound to happen, that you just try to provide us with, with the data and the information that we're requesting respectfully. So I, I thank you for your testimony and for the answers. And with that, I turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. I just want to ask one more question on on <coughs> sort of related topic, and then sorry, I'll take I'll hand over to the chair. On staffing, are you guys feel like you're properly staffed today? You do. And um, do you can you just talk about any challenges you have in terms of recruiting staff to work in any of the jails? Challenges you face, you know, how that happens, and also any issues or comments you hear with that regard to safety and security of staff there. Just would be curious to hear more on the actual challenges or. Or, or how you're overcoming any challenges related to staffing. 
So I think on the clinical side, you know, this has really been one of the critical successes of this transition um, is that it's, it's changed the landscape for recruiting really mission-driven people, clinicians across the spectrum from nursing, social work, doctors, both on the medical and the mental health side, uh, down to pharmacists, pharmacy techs, really across the board, recruiting people who want to be part of fixing a problem, who want to be part of uh, a, a mission-driven organization. Um, and we have an, a, a litany of really amazing physicians, in particular, who've come to work with us um, in the last few years. Uh, and that recruiting is way more successful than it ever could have been under the old model. Um, people feel like they're part of something, and people who are informed by mass incarceration as a social issue uh, and came to this work because of that uh, work for us and uh, find the work rewarding and find that they're part of something that's meaningful and important. Um, so that's a critical change. Um, recruiting is a constant effort. We've built um, systems to have relationships with training programs across the spectrum of clinical services so that we get trainees into the jails to show them what we do, to show them the importance of our work, and to recruit them to be the next generation of clinicians to help us. Anything you can say around, I mean, we've heard some concerns around, you know, potential, I mean, in potential new jails would, would, would fix some of these issues, but um, just safety issues, security issues related to staff that's there. Yeah, I mean, just to echo what, what Ross said, uh, the, our ability to attract and retain people and just change the culture and lift up everybody, um, not just, the, as I say, do the work, but improve the work. Um, has really been boosted by by this this move to to uh, by our, the current model, um, which is not to say that um, recruitment, um, particularly on off hours and weekends, isn't difficult or challenging. Particularly in in a, an environment that is challenging, it's we acknowledge it and and um, our staff deserve the highest respect and thanks for for taking those on every single day um, and putting the health and well-being of our patients above theirs. Um, so recognizing that the jails are a tough place, we have been working um, within CHS and in close partnership with DOC um, to raise the bar on, on staff safety and security. Um, when we came over to Health and Hospitals, which has a very robust workplace violence program, we benefited greatly from that in terms of training materials, structure, reporting, support. Um, so there's been a lot more training of our staff specifically um, and joint training with DOC in, th in techniques like de-escalation, right, that reduces stuff. We have daily, um, con hot, they're called huddles, but in all the jails with DOC and CHS where um, potentially behaviorally challenging patients are identified. We talk about what precautions could be taken beforehand, how we might differently manage um, a situation. So I, I think it's a range of everything from training support to physical um, plant reorganization, as you, as you mentioned, um, was it Ray? Um, when, when I think we were in one of those design conversations about the borough jails that, that the lines of sight and daily, you know, everything from lines of sight for safety to um, natural light, right, which changes the entire mood of a place. Um, we are really excited about um, and, and are really hoping that that allows us to do what we know works well and better more. Thank you. Yes. Also, I just want to recognize two of my colleagues that were here, Council Member Moya and Council Member Eugene. Uh, so thank you. Ready? Yeah. Thank you. Does the electronic record system allow you to see services that were rendered throughout the network or just services that have been rendered at Rikers? Um, it, it, it's within our, the, our system um, is, is the care that we provide within the jail system, the correctional health system or pre-arraignment, the entire justice involved system. But um, as we are part of health and hospitals, we have interfaces with particularly with Bellevue and Elmhurst, which are where the outpatient specialty and our inpatient care is provided. So we get to see theirs, they get to see ours. Um, there is that exchange that, that is supported. But only for those two hospitals. 
those are the really the two hospitals that we use. Yeah. Um, that we that, that where referrals are made either on outpatient basis or inpatient basis. Um, ultimately, there will be um, some movement towards uh, better integration. The health and hospitals itself is undergoing, as you well know, a, a, yeah. a migration to a new system. Um, definitely, to be part of the enterprise and interface with the enterprise is a goal. I mean, because Metropolitan Hospital wouldn't be considered part of that process, and yet we have a psychiatric department there. So if an individual was treated there for psychiatric you know, illness and then went to Rikers, you wouldn't be able to gauge that right now. Is that correct? Um, not on, a, on an electronic systems yeah. basis. Okay. So you, right now, but that is yeah. the plan. Yeah. Um, how does the, uh, can you explain how does the, uh, the intake process differ for someone who has a developmental disability and may have, you know, trouble articulating their own history? Sure. Um, so, again, I think that's the critical function of having those high-level staff doing that evaluation. So, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and physicians who are trained to recognize the signs of developmental delay yeah. uh, and are now have additional screening questions that they have to complete uh, to look for those conditions, as well as changes in our mental health service to better um, uh, treat uh, that patient population and understand their needs once we identify them up front. Do you have a number of individuals with developmental disabilities at Rikers right now? Do you know? What is the percentage? It's about three percent. About three percent, and what type of disabilities, more or less? So they they run the gamut. Um, I think um, you know there is a system uh, OPWDD, uh, which uh, should take care of um, developmental disabilities that are known to that system. Uh, but um, sometimes uh, people will come to jail who have not yet become enrolled in that system. Uh, and so, or uh, patients will be at a sort of borderline level where they have some degree of developmental delay, uh, but they would not necessarily meet the, the strict criteria for entry into OPWDD. Um, so, it, and that process, you know, uh, takes some time to sort out, and we've improved our processes and our communication with those partners to, to do that work as quickly as possible. Um, but when, when you say time, how much time? What, what are you talking about? A, way, a week, a month, a year? I, I mean, most people don't spend that much time at Rikers, but. Well, so I think, I, I can't say. It happens on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think the key that we've recognized is we can't defer that work to other systems and other entities because at that moment, that patient is with us, right? Um, so that's where we've built up a specialized uh, expertise and, and housing options for that particular population and done that intake screening more robust in a more robust way to try to get those people linked into care and to treat them appropriately um, for whatever time they're there. Um, so, so just just in the two years that we've we've been you know us yeah. um, we've recognized that the developmental population is some somebody who's been largely hidden um, and been lost somewhere in the system previously, so we've done a number of things acknowledging fully that there's a long way to go, um, and that's ranged from uh, developing a, a better screening tool, which has increased, again, the pro you know, who we can identify from about two-thirds of 1% to 3%. Mm -hmm. It's probably more, but we keep refining our tool and, and doing that. We've actually dedicated a PACE unit for for people with, with neurodevelopmental disorders and disease and disabilities so that they we can provide better treatment on site, better engagement, better linkages, better care while they're with us and linkages outside. Um, we are currently recruiting for um, a social worker who will be dedicated and expert in the, this population and the community resources so that we can both provide better care focus mm -hmm. and get guidance while, while people are with us and then when they're leaving. So these are these are nascent. We we acknowledge that, but we we recognized um, last year that we needed to do something. Um, we have been convening um, regular meetings with community partners and state partners to create linkages. The, the the network out there for this population overall needs needs to grow. 
Are special accommodations made in the living quarters of individuals, let's say the person that may be quadriplegic and, you know, a wheelchair user, they require special, you know, accommodations be made. Beds need to be able to, you know, move. Um, doors need to be able to open inwards. Uh, what accommodations are made considering that the facility is pretty aged and uh, pretty deficient at this point? Yeah, so another important function of the intake screening process is to screen for disabilities. Uh, and uh, patients with the requirements that you're describing would be transferred to infirmary settings, mm -hmm. uh, which are ADA compliant, and we work very closely with the Department of Correction uh, on, on that issue. Uh, can you, I know that we've been asking this, but we're, we're really trying to get a, a response. So can you explain like what some of the reasons that DOC would be unable to present an incarcerated individual uh, for a medical appointment would be? Is it, is, has it ever been, you know, has the failure ever to, to produce an inmate ever been due to staffing issues? No. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we work very closely with health and hospitals and when we are given the list of uh, patients to be produced for uh, appointments uh, our staff frontline st uh, uniform staff uh, officers captains will meet with the uh, clinical staff to review those lists to make sure that you know the priority patients that they need to be seen are brought and if someone is not produced advise them accordingly they work collectively as a team to make sure that those patients are produced so who follows up with the patient that did not show up to find out why they didn't show up to an appointment? Well, as I said before, uh, the officers and the cl clinic captain will work with the uh, with, with the uh, clinical staff there. Uh, if, uh, for example, if we uh, the officer goes to a housing area and the inmate says, "I'm not going for my appointment," you know. Uh, we will come back. We'll communicate communicate that to to H uh, and H. Uh, they will make a determination, as, uh, you know, in terms of whether we need to talk to that person a little bit more to get them to the clinic. We've done that frequently, where we'll get not, not only a captain involved, we'll get a tour commander. We will try to go to the highest level within the department. Do you do that for every no, inmate, no or do you do that for cases where there's an extreme need? Cases that are that we work together that have been identified as someone that must be seen that they need to see that person, can miss that appointment. We try to escalate it to the highest level to make sure we get that and person. And do you document provided. the reason why in the, in the person's uh, record, the reason why they're explaining that they didn't come to the appointment? Is, like, is that tr something that you track? We will just note very briefly in the list there that the person refused. But, but not why. Because, I mean, there's a difference if you're no longer presenting symptoms, then you couldn't go because you had to go to court or because you had... Well, if it's out the court, yes. Time. If it's out the court or something like that, yes. We will, if the person out of court, yes, we will document that in the list. We will let the medical staff know or the clinical staff know this person's out the court or if the person went to wreck and doesn't, you know, whatever the situation is. So are, are, if assuming that there's a case scenario where an, uh, an inmate uh, was supposed to show up for call, uh, call time, um, and did not show, and then the DOC officer, you know, approaches the individual and says, hey, you know, why didn't you show up? And they say, well, because I had, you know, I had to choose between going to see the doctor and making, you know, and calling my family. But this is a person that, a person that's been presenting, you know, serious uh, symptoms. Is there a follow-up, you know, to that in, in, a, in a case scenario like that? So I would just say on the clinical side, we're tracking all of those cases of non-production. So it never ends with we just didn't see somebody. We would then have a process in place to reschedule that person. So that isolated number of non-production is for a given day. Um, but the, a big part of the work of the clinical service using the electronic health record is to make sure that we're tracking those cases and continuing to get in contact with those people to manage their clinical condition. Now, how many of the people that don't show up are ment uh, have been diagnosed with a mental illness? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're good. Uh, I don't think we have the particular non-production uh, um, broken out by that, um, but I, I think that you know it's a struggle across the clinical services to get people to care, um, but the key point remains that we keep trying until we see people. Um, so we would never discharge somebody from the clinical service for the reason of non-production. 
we have to actually reach them and talk to them and understand what's going on here. So m moving on, so does, does DOC and H&H &H, um, track incarcerated individual 311 calls relating to medical complaints? Does 311 report these calls to DOC and H&H? &H? Um, <coughs> yeah, so I think DOC will probably want to yes. answer for themselves, but we, we definitely do. Um, so when 311 became free in the jail, um, it has um, kind of overtaken all sources of um, kind of uh, inmate uh, patient communication to us. Um, in terms of um, medical mental health condition um, and request. Um, and so I think um, last year we had about um, 2,100 of kind of these communications and 56% of them were 311. Um, so um, it's, it, it's an active part. I think um, we're trying, you know, trying to figure out how to deal with it, but I think the important thing is that um, we see uh, or we dispose of every single case that comes our way through this process. But that's, that's, that's where I'm a little confused because if I, if I have access to, if I have adequate access to a medical provider that is up to par. Why, w I, I, don't, I don't understand the rationale, why a person would choose then to have to call 311. Uh, I think DOC could probably talk about some of the benefits. Of well, you know, a very common reason, you know, uh, as I s spoke about earlier about uh, coming on for a sick call, and sick call is called to the housing area. But when you come to the clinic, of course, you're not coming into the clinic and get called in immediately you probably wait a half hour, whatever time there is in the clinic to wait. Sad to tell you, but sometimes uh, patients don't want to come to the clinic for that waiting time. So their bypass is to call 311 to put a, a call in, and when they come But they're the signing up voluntarily, so I don't understand Pardon why me? they, aren't they signing, I, signing up voluntarily? Well, no, you, you're talking about two different things now. Okay. We're talking about the scheduled mm -hmm. follow-ups, which mm -hmm. we talked about se separately before, and we talked about sick call where they're signing up. But sometimes, even when they sign up and you call their housing area, they don't want to come to the clinic and wait. And I'm not saying that's for everyone. There's a, a percentage of those where it happens. So if you call 311, the call comes into my office uh, through the constituent services. Now we assign a, a staff. We call H&H. &H. We said to them, here is an inmate who called and uh, needs to see a, a doctor, whatever the reason case might be. We will then call our uh, facility, the detour commander, and go say, go to the housing area, have someone go to the housing area, pick this inmate up, and bring him to the clinic. That's like getting an expedited service to the clinic to get seen, bypassing everything else. I'm not saying that's the case for everything, but th those situations do happen. It does happen. I mean, it's 2,100 inmates, that's a, uh, well, 2,100 calls. That's a significant number of calls. Well, they're not all medical calls. Uh, you know, there are different reasons why those calls People will come call 311? What, what is another reason what, that an inmate will call 311? It could be for uh, a visit uh, issue. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, it could be a multitude of different issues, yes. Okay. Um, when mental health appointments are missed, does DOC notice a spike in behavioral issues among incarcerated individuals? For example, if a person with a mental health diagnosis misses an appointment with a mental health provider, how does the impact? How does that impact their need uh, while incarcerated? Again, you know, as I said before, we work very closely with H and H to make sure that all the patients that they request are brought down. Of course, we have officers who are m mental health first aid trained, uh, and if they notice something unusual with a patient, they would make that referral. They, you know, they would. They have that communication with the respective clinical staff in that facility where they would refer that patient to the clinic on their own. But as I said before, if that person's scheduled, we try our best. And as Dr. McDonald pointed out before, if that person uh, is not seen in that day, that person will be rescheduled very shortly. Do most mental health patients self-disclose that they have a mental illness when they come in, or is that something that is identified that throughout the that intake process? That's something that we identify. Correctional Health Services <laughs> identifies during intake if they, they can also tell us. On intake, but the intake process is, is is on day one, right? Within twenty, the standard is within twenty four hours of, of incarceration, and of being taken into custody. And some mental illnesses do require some level of uh, personal observation, and yes, so so there can be a referral immediately at intake to mental health, um, and I'm it, it's important to note that um, for so if we're talking about production, that is about ninety percent of those intake referrals to mental health are are accomplished 
by CHS um, within se the 72 hours that's required. I, I just wanted, if I if I could go back to the, yeah. the question about mental health, um, again, you know, one of the, the differences in the way we, we run our mental health services is that, that that connection between the patient and the provider is paramount. Yeah. So we want to maintain that continuity of care and that relationship that accounts for some of the rescheduling that you see that's higher that we do. Um, recognizing that production has improved but could always get better and how critical mental health services I are and medication is. Um, that CHS has done not only work with C DOC to improve production, but we've also um, come up with our own initiatives and ways to um, reduce the demand on DOC to escort people, but yet maintain or increase access to care. And that's everything from the, the PACE units and the CAPS units, but also in our MOs, the, the ones that aren't designated as PACE and CAPS and don't have that environment or that level of staffing, that we are there and present more often in the mental health units so that we are engaging patients, communicating with them, watching, interacting, and providing care and counseling on site. I just wanted to mention, yeah. so, um, and DOC makes referrals to the mental health service as well. So there is a process by which DOC officers, if they're observing something in the housing area, that they can make a referral directly to mental health and we will evaluate that person. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that on specialized mental health units, mental observation units, as well as the CAPS and PACE units, all of the mental health encounters in those areas occur on the unit. Um, so there is no issue of production with that type of cohort of housing. Um, and that's the highest level of mental health service that we provide and generally the highest level of need is concentrated in those, those units. Do you track the number of referrals that are made by DOC related to mental illness, to mental health issues? So if you, let's say an inmate comes in and you do the, you know, you process them, you, you know, we go through the, the regular intake process and you know, no one, there's nothing that would indicate that this individual has a mental health issue until a few days later. And I'm, I'm assuming that's when DOC refers. Do you track the number of referrals? I think we'll have to check on that. It's a paper <laughs> form that we get from DOC uh, that initiates that process. Um, so I think we'll have to get back to you yeah. if we have data on that. It was a fair question. We, we, I just thought we checked data in our electronic health record. Mm -hmm. We might be able to sample something and right. get back to you on that. Yeah. I'm, I, 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 I mention it because I, and I, I often speak to this. My, I have a, 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 my brother, my younger brother, was incarcerated from the time that he was 11 to the time that he was 33 years old, in and out of different, you know, he was in Rikers, he was in Spofford, he's been upstate, and he was never diagnosed with a mental illness until he came out. And it was pretty evident towards the end that his behavior was pretty erratic, yet he would never receive treatment, you know, in uh, any of these institutions. And it, it wasn't until he got home that we were able to realized that he had a serious mental health issue, but it, it wasn't easy to diagnose either initially because they have already adapted, right? And they've learned to kind of, you know, blend in. And, and, and so it takes a specific, you know, kind of attention to realize. I mean, um, in his case, it was pretty severe. He was very manic. Um, so, I, you know, it's always pretty alarming you know, to me, and again, this has been many, many, many years, and I'm sure that the, you know, the system has gotten s uh, significantly better, or at least I would hope, um, but, you know, the f it's important to note, like, if something like that happened, we missed it, a lot of people missed it, right, on day one, what happens on day 10? Does somebody pick it up and say, you know what, I was trained on first health, mental, you know, health, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I recognize that this person is exhibiting, you know, symptoms of, you know, bipolar or whatever, that would be important to know, at least for me. Um, and my final question is, the uh, so the city's fiscal budget allocated $1.8 million to CHS in fiscal year 2017 through Healing NYC, the administration's plan to combat the opioid epidemic. The funding, which increased to $5 million in fiscal year 2018, was intended to expand uh, um, access to naloxone, methadone, and buprenorphine, and to improve discharge planning outpatient referral services. What are the outcomes of this funding? Uh, specifically, how many individuals, additional individuals, received naloxone, methadone, buprenorphine through this $5 million investment? I can speak to generalities yeah. while we look for the specific numbers, um, but this has really been a tremendous success story of, of yeah. the transition. Um, we've just about been able to triple the number of daily people on methadone and buprenorphine 
which is a critical need for our system. Uh, we historically, um, eligibility for these life-saving medications was based on charges, um, and it was because of a, a prediction of a person going to the state uh, prison system where these medications were not available. Um, with this additional funding, we were able, and improved data systems, we were able to throw any eligibility criteria out the window, and we only use clinical determinations to decide who is eligible for methadone and buprenorphine today. This will absolutely save lives based on what we know uh, uh, of the effect of these medications for people with opioid use disorder. Um, and it's a tremendous achievement that we're very proud of. Um, I think in the coming months, hopefully, we'll have data uh, from post-release outcomes uh, to show um, even a mortality benefit of this expansion. Can I just, sorry, I'm, I'm doing a quick round of arithmetic in my head, but um, since last year, um, last year on methadone, we had 709 uh, patients, or close to 3,000. Uh, 120 for BUP, and the target there is 450. And we're not done with fiscal year 18 yet. Okay. And what is the discharge plan? Because assuming that a person comes in and they're in there for maybe two or three days, um, I'm assuming that an individual that has a chemical dependency is going to be, you know, is going to say that immediately because mm -hmm. they don't yes. want to get sick, so they want medication. But is there a conversation with them about yes. aftercare? Because we know that, you know, the numbers, uh, the mortality r uh, yeah. rates, you know, were have been pretty significantly high, right? Because people don't understand that now they detox and they come out and they get high and yes, right. their body doesn't absorb yeah. the chemicals. So it's everything from counseling, risk reduction, harm reduction, um, and maintenance and connection to community providers. Um, and we just started a re-prescribing naloxone program so that we can train people on how to use naloxone and then when they discharge, they can pick that up in, the ph in their pharmacy along with everything else. So they have that in case. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. I, I had a couple more questions, and I'm sorry, and then I'll, I'll hand it over. I, I, I'm sorry. This really bothers me, and I'm sorry I have to ask this question for the fourth time, but f I just did a quick math. 50,000 appointments were masked in the last six months because of DOC's failure to report the first uh, We don't have any... We've not been given any single explanation for that today. But actually, there was some that they could rescheduled. That was a fair answer, and I, I appreciate that. Um, what's the number one reason? Can you share us like a, a single year reason that may be a high reason why in that number, I'm just talking about the last six months of last year, and I think there's more data this year. You have plenty of staff here from DOC. Why failure to report? Or is it staffing? Is it lockdowns? Is it? First, uh, the number seems very high. I, you know, uh, I'll have to go back and look at that, to be very honest with you. Um, but if I had to give you one single um, example of uh, what may contribute to that number, it's the uh, undocumented refusals, where I said earlier that an inmate might be scheduled for uh, an appointment. The officer goes up to the housing area. The inmate says, I'm not going. I don't want to go anymore. You know, but that is uh, the only time that that is considered uh, mm -hmm. acceptable. That inmate must come down to uh, the H&H &H staff and sign that refusal in the presence of a clinical staff where that staff will be educated by the uh, clinical staff. So if, if I have to think of something offhand, that's one of the things that sticks out in my head because I see that very often that happens in the uh, system. So sorry, there's, an, there's a documented refusal and then there's an undocumented refusal Correct. and you're saying undocumented refusal, meaning the person won't sign a form? He would not come to the, that person has to refuse in the presence of a clinical staff. That's called a documented refusal. Okay, and that's a nine for 8% or something like that by the numbers in the BOC report, I think. Um, and you're saying, and do we have an idea of how what percentage of that Number total number of the of the DOC failure to uh, bring the person number that is. No, I don't. You have a, you say it's the highest one. I think. Do you have an idea what that would represent? If I tell you offhand, I'll be really misinforming you. Okay, appreciate that. I really appreciate the honesty. Yep. Uh, but uh, other 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 reasons you can list. 
uh, there, there might be times uh, when the inmate may say, uh, you know, I, I'm expecting a visit. Very common. You know, there Which would be an undocumented refusal, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah. But they'll say visit. They, they won't say I'm refusing the service. They're just saying I'm having a visit. Uh, and the other – I guess on the CHS side, on the DOC side, do you believe you're staffed adequately to – for the for this purpose, you're staffed adequately? I will say to you that we have done a lot of work. Uh, when I say a lot of work in terms of educating our clinic officers, our clinic captains, uh, I actually go to every of the uh, classes now, even the new uh, higher classes for officers, the promotional classes of captains for – assistant deputy wardens, as, uh, deputy wardens, to educate every one of them. We have a PowerPoint that we have actually prepared that we uh, try to educate all our staff about the importance of clinic production and what are the things that we expect of them. On a weekly basis, I have a conference call every Thursday, which I missed today, uh, with all the clinic captains, uh, specifically uh, looking at and addressing production issues, any kind of clinical issues, anything that may, may arise. Once a month, we do have a meeting, a collaborative meeting, a joint meeting with all our uh, health service administrators from uh, H&H, their DONs, uh, the deputy warden, the chief may attend that meeting, uh, uh, assistant chief may attend that meeting once a month. And that's where we actually, and I, and I use this over and over again, that we work very closely to address all those uh, production issues. It's a work in progress day in and day out. Okay, I appreciate it. And just, just for the clarity, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong on the numbers, but uh, I, took, I took those from the BOC report <laughs> from end of last year, just for clarity's sake, but happy to be proven wrong uh, on that and otherwise. Um, I, I will end there, and I'll ask Councilman Rivera if I think he had some follow-up. He said an un undocumented refusal. Um, when, you're, when an incarcerated individual has to make a choice between school or rec time or sick call, would those count as an undocumented refusal if they choose one over the other? The answer is yes. And, I mean, I think we would all say that, that rec time is incredibly important to the health of the individual. Are, are ever sick call and rec time scheduled in conflict? If we, uh, most of the time, we know the time of the rec, so we will schedule the call on, especially for sick call, we will not call the housing area. If their rec time is at 10 o'clock in the morning, we definitely will not call that housing area for a sick call at 10 o'clock in the morning. Scheduled appointments is a different story. If the person has uh, an appointment to go to the clinic, again, we will try to work around those scheduled uh, activities within the housing area. Because we, we did get this uh, BOC report and they have a very uh, percentage of people left without being seen. So I'm just curious as to your description and how many people are not produced, but we can, you can kind of just let us know at a future date because I want to ask one last question. Who recruits the doctors, Pagni or H&H? &H? H &H. So um, is there a reason why people don't sign up directly with CHS for an appointment or for sick call? Why does it have to go through DOC? Can I answer that part of the question? I, I, I'm asking, is there a reason why incarcerated individuals don't sign up directly with CHS? For sick call? Uh, <coughs> the, the, the New York City Board of Corrections standards right now and the way the program has been set up and run is that they, a patient can, a, a person can ask to be seen, and DOC is obliged to produce that person to clinic. When they show up at the clinic, is the order that people are seen based on severity, like their need, or is it based on how they sign up in terms of like first come, first serve? So um, when they're checked into the electronic medical record, it <coughs> sets a timer. Um, so we generally try to see people in the order that they show up. Um, you know, that's people feel that that's the fairest way to do it, um, so we honor that. Um, of course, if somebody has an acute issue, um, then we'll address that in real time. Okay, thank you. 
Good, thank you. And and I think you might have answered the question, but I just wanted to ask just, and I know that you have, there'll be more time to review and comment, so I, I won't hold any initial comments to you, but just on the legislation that is on the table today from myself and Councilmember Rivera, which does require coordination around sick calls between CHS and DOC. Any initial feedback or comments on it? I will wait, I have to read it. <laughs> okay, Sorry. we'll look forward to your comments. Thank you, uh, any other? Okay, great, thank you, thanks yeah, for your time. Thanks, thanks thank so you. much. Next up, we are gonna have the Board of Corrections come up, Dr. Robert Cohen and Executive Director Martha King. a minute. If everyone could raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Is it on? Good afternoon, Chairs Rivera, Ayala, and Powers, and members of the committees on hospitals, mental health, disabilities, and addiction, and criminal justice. My name is Martha King, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction. Today I am joined by Emily Turner, Deputy Executive Director of Research, and Dr. Robert Cohen, a board member who was appointed by the City Council and is a correctional health expert and former director of the Rikers Island Correctional Health Service. The Board of Correction is the city's independent oversight agency for the jail system. We do not manage the operations or services within the jails. Rather, we regulate and monitor them on behalf of New Yorkers. The board writes local regulations called minimum standards. These include chapters dedicated to health and mental health care, and they cover everything from detection to treatment and patient protections, um, and they seek to ensure that services are maintained at a professional and quality level consistent with community standards. In many ways, this city has been a leader in correctional health for decades. For one, New York City is exceptional because it has an independent health care provider in the jails. Most jails have one leadership that runs both the security and health operations, leading to challenging and inherent conflicts that do not always serve the patient well. Other examples of exceptional work have been Correctional Health Service's successful collaboration with the Department of Correction on intensive therapeutic mental health units, as well as CHS's longstanding and effective opioid treatment program. The board monitors correctional health in multiple ways. Observations in the jails by our staff who are on the ground daily, tours by board members, interventions and in individual complaints raised by people inside or their advocates and families, and investigations into deaths in custody. In 2016, we significantly improved our ability to monitor care by working with CHS to create a monthly access report which tracks compliance with the board standards on access and the 55,000 scheduled health and mental health appointments each month. The CHS monthly access report represents the most comprehensive reporting on health and mental health care access in jails nationally. During the last six months of 2017, 79% of health and mental health care services scheduled in New York City jails were completed. This means more specifically that 72% of appointments included a patient seeing a clinician and 7% included a patient refusing the service. Our analysis of this data has led us to focus on four priorities. One, barriers to production. 
two, extending best practices, three, access to specialty clinic and mental health appointments, and four, new protocols to monitor sick call and other key areas of the minimum standards. Just over a fifth of all scheduled services were not completed in our study period. The proportions of missed appointments vary by service category and facility. However, the main reason that patients missed appointments for all months studied and across all services was because the patient was not produced by DOC. Almost 70% of all missed appointments were due to DOC not producing the person to the clinician. CHS does not currently report reasons for non-production, and these reasons are not always known to clinical staff. We all should better understand if failure to produce a patient is because of a lockdown, staff shortage, scheduling conflict, search, or some other reason. We need DOC and CHS to track and report on the reasons for non-production in a coordinated way. They need to develop a plan to track and address barriers to production, the main cause of missed appointments. Appointment completion rates varied by facility during the last six months of 2017 ranging from a 67% overall completion rate at VCBC to a 92% completion rate at NIC. Completion rates for medical and dental services in particular varied widely across facilities. Medical services ranged from a low 54% completion rate at AMKC to a 98% completion rate at MDC. Dental completion rates ranged from 48% at VCBC to 84% at RNDC. There are jail services that have had consistently higher rates of production and access. DOC and CHS should review the reasons for this and the best practices from jails with high rates of completed appointments, including NIC, West Facility, and Rose M. Singer Center. This information should be used to generate benchmarks and plans for improvement in other service areas and facilities where current rates are unacceptable. During the last six months of 2017, about 30% of mental health appointments were missed. In this critical service area, 64% of all missed services were due to DOC non-production, and 19% were due to CHS rescheduling the appointment, the highest rate of rescheduling across all services. Over 39,500 mental health appointments were missed in this period. This is over five times as many missed appointments than any other area. Considering that 45% of people detained in the city's jails have mental health needs and that these patients are some of the most vulnerable, reviewing and minimizing barriers to access for them should be a priority. The next category of service most likely to be missed was on-island specialty clinics. 27% of these appointments were missed. In addition, too many appointments of this type are refused by patients. BKDC had a refusal rate of 55% for on-island specialty clinic appointments. Specialty, clinic, specialty clinics are reserved for some of the most medically vulnerable patients who are awaiting advanced surgeries, procedures, and appointments that cannot be carried out in facility clinics. Almost half of completed off-island specialty clinic appointments and 31% of completed on-island specialty clinic appointments involved a patient refusing services. Seven jails had refusal rates of 50% or higher for off-island appointments. People in custody and jail staff report that high rates of patient refusals for these appointments are due to lengthy wait times, overbooking, waiting area conditions, including a lack of space and transportation challenges. DOC and CHS should conduct an in-depth review of access in these areas to identify and address factors thought to be related to patient refusals. BOC will also release an in-depth look at specialty clinic access in 2019. After intake, sick call is the primary way people in custody access care. The proposed council bill will greatly enhance the accurate tracking of sick call. Our monitoring suggests people requesting sick call regularly do not receive it. We have called on DOC and CHS to implement new tracking protocols to assess compliance with the minimum standards on sick call, the intake process, timeliness of services, and substance use treatment services. Access to health and mental health care in New York City jails has been discussed at 12 public 
board meetings since January 2016. During these public discussions, board members have frequently cited their concerns related to access to care, including lockdowns, production, escorting, transportation to Bellevue and Elmhurst hospitals, sick call, and specialty clinic policies. Discussions on these issues have repeatedly confronted the need for improved tracking and outcomes related to the minimum standards on health and mental health care. This information is necessary to minimize barriers and improve access to and ultimately improve the quality of care via measurable reforms. In closing, access is a fundamental policy and principle of the board's minimum standards and of all nationally recognized jail standards. It is supported by long-standing legal opinions that require the state to provide quality health care to people while in its custody, and it is central to safe and more humane jails. We look forward to working with DOC, CHS, and the Council on efforts to improve it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. I appreciate the chance to make just a few comments. Uh, and I'm going to actually give Martha credit because uh, the, it was her you know, decision several years ago to work with the DOC and, and CHS to collect the kind of data that is being published on a monthly basis to look at access. And, you know, and um, I'm very proud of that, of that work. And, uh, and you're seeing some of the results of it before you. Um, I endorse everything that, uh, that, that Martha just said. Um, The department and CHS is well aware that, for example, and I just want to stress this thing, the specialty on and off island cares, those are the, those other than the mental health, which is a separate and critical issue. And I'll talk about some terrible consequences of, of, of lack of access to, uh, you, know, you know, patients not brought to care in mental health. That, 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 that persons on Rikers Island and, and off Rikers Island in Brooklyn House in particular are refusing their, their, their appointments at Bellevue or coming to Rikers Island for, uh, for, for specialty care because they have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, which is not, you know, which is explainable and understandable. There's lots of transportation difficulties in New York. But then when they get there, they're not seen. When they get there, there's not a place to be seen. So many people got on buses and were brought to Bellevue after the clinics were over. So, so these kinds of, you know, now everybody's aware of that and everybody's working very hard to fix it, but it's not been fixed yet. And I, I don't think that, uh, that the major problem here, uh, I just dis disagree with, uh, with, 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 with Commissioner you know, Youssef about, uh, it's, it's to, to, to blame the victim uh, you know, for, 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 for this one. On several occasions, I just have to respond to, to, to Patsy's and others' com complaint. Uh, um, about uh, the Board of Correction Standards being the reason why there's no coordination between the medical and, and you know, medical program and DOC. We do, re we do require that there be daily access to sick call. That is a very difficult thing to do. If it's not being done, we would like to know it, you would like to know it, and we'd like to figure out what can be done to, to fix it. But, but you can't fix it if you don't know it. And the, and the Board of Correction Standards do not prevent CHS from understanding who is asking for sick call. From my, from my perspective, uh, I do not want a commitment to trying to figure out what's going on with sick call to take away from any of the other terrific work with CHS is doing. And I, I, you know, it, I don't think it came out enough in the, in the whole discussion, but it is an amazing program. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and it's much better than what I did <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I worked there. And some of the changes that have occurred recently you should be very proud of as, you know, as, uh, as you know, people who were responsible for what goes on in the, in the city. Um, but uh, we, when someone requests sick call, that should be entered into the CHS electronic medical record. And then we could figure out whether it's happening or not happening, if it's a staffing issue, if it's a production issue. And there really, there really is a production issue. Um, and, and that is fundamental to correctional health care. There are contradictions between what the providing medical care and providing care, custody, and control. These are, these, are different, these are different projects, and they will be in conflict, and that doesn't mean that people aren't of goodwill or serious, or we're not in New York City where people really care about this right now, you know, particularly including the Department of Correction, but those problems are real, and they're gonna happen, and if we don't look at them, then we won't get as far, then we won't, we won't solve them. Um, two other points, uh, and I, it's one of these I think occurred during, uh, I believe may have occurred by CHS's current watch in terms of actually providing care. One of them may have been before, but there were t two suicides 
in the past period where where the um, where the person was identified as needing medic one where a person was identified as needing medication they were they knew they were they were depressed they were on medication they weren't responding and on about five occasions I'd have to go back and check and I you know this is stuff that you I can't give you the chart and I don't have the chart um, where their appointment was not they were not produced and they said it's not working so these are real these are real Real, real, real issues, and everybody's working very hard. But it, but it is um, the fact that the mental health numbers are so high is really problematic. And one of the reasons, and this is a larger story, but there are 2,000 people in AMKC. It is a dysfunctional institution from the perspective of delivering program services. And I think the city should be careful about building new institutions that are 1,500 beds because that's too many, also. But a 2,000 person. Uh, institution doesn't work and when I was there in the 1980s we were building mini clinics to solve this problem it's too big it's not going to be solved by, uh, by by that it should be broken up into two commands but I, that's a that's another subject uh, um, I think um, I think I'll just stop right now and be available to stay for questions thank you thanks for both uh, the comments and the testimony um, I had a couple early questions and then I'll hand it off um, on the non-production, which I think we all asked questions about because we were sort of, you know, sort of somewhat bewildered of not being able to get clear data. You guys had marked it as something that you were concerned about as well in your report, and I think something that we always want to make sure if you want access, you need access. And I understand the challenges with that. Can you can you share with us any any insights into why the there might be non-production for not produced by DOC is such a high category and what subcategories might fall into that and in terms of sort of high high uh, reasons for, for non-production? Um, well, again, tracking this systematically is going to be critical. Um, uh, the department does track um, their own, has their own tracking um, around reasons for non-production. They're not doing it particularly well, and that's probably why they didn't feel comfortable giving you numbers. Um, one of the reasons that they track is alarms related to lockdown. So when a lockdown occurs, all um, movement in the facilities needs to stop. Um, another reason is if, um, as was mentioned earlier, if there's a conflict between um, on a scheduled appointment or another mandated service or another service um, that an individual may want to participate in um, those conflicts do um, may lead to people not making their appointments um, there is an escort issue that is a reason that the department is in fact tracking so I'm not clear why <coughs> they wouldn't just tell you that sometimes people can't be escorted to their appointments um, and um, but but tracking and and clearly tracking what those reasons are. Um, we've been told sometimes um, from the department that they will, they can't bring people to their appointment because there isn't enough space um, to house someone at the clinic. There may be too many appointments booked at that time. They can't safely house um, people with certain security designations together. That's another example of why it might not happen. But again, if that's an issue, we need to track it. We t need to know it. and. Um, need to address those challenges. Um, I mean, another another issue here is I think um, with respect to this issue of, of patients not wanting to go to their appointment, um, um, that varies sort of by by the type of appointment we're talking about. So, um, if it is one of these um, specialty clinic appointments where the individual needs to be transported. Um, that can be a very unpleasant experience. It can be an all-day experience. It can involve getting on buses and waiting on buses, being restrained while waiting on buses, um, and then ultimately end up in missing an appointment. And so if you're rescheduled and you're told, okay, it's time for you to go back on the bus for your appointment that you missed, you've already had a bad experience with the system and you may not want um, to go through that process again. Um, but that's why... Um, the board will be doing an in-depth look at what's going on in terms of um, completion
completion of specialty clinic appointments in the next in the coming year. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. I wish I had received a answer like that when we were asking until the earlier panel something a little with a little more substance um, on the um, on the discrepancies between the jails and as you noted with 2000 2000 folks um, and what and, and, and changes in difference in the population obviously being it part of it um, can you tell us and and especially as we look forward here um, some of the challenges in more detail some of the challenges around uh, we had talked about physical limitations earlier uh, with the with the with the two agencies, but can you talk to us more about what you're seeing in terms of low completion rates at AMKC around 50 percent and MDC 98 percent and others in terms of wide variations and thoughts on how we can improve those sort of across the board and close gaps between uh, how different jails are uh, are completing. Well, I'll just say it's really hard to run a 2000, and it was even 2700 at some point, uh, uh, AMKC. It's just, it's just really difficult. And uh, I think the department should be careful going forward to not close another facility on Rikers Island when it doesn't really, you know, it would be better to, to decompress one of, the, you know, one of the facilities and and rather than just close it down and lose, you know, and keep things as cut, you know, keep, keep things at, this, at the same density. Uh, I think the, the, the measures that, that, that were described in terms of setting up other clinics is a, is a good idea. I think that the, 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 that the um, DOC and, and uh, CHS can work better in terms of actually having the clinics functioning over a longer period of time. Uh, when you go there, there are lots of times when nothing is happening, it seems to me, um, and there are all kinds of reasons, mainly from the, from the correctional operation of the facility, which can be improved. There are efficiencies without increasing staff. There are staff there when there aren't per persons there. And uh, so uh, I, I, and I'm sure that they're working on that, but that's the, that's the kind of thing. But, I, you know, but um, it, is, it is a very large place, and it shouldn't, it, it, when there's the opportunity, it should be decompressed rather than another facility closed prematurely just to prove that they're closing the facility. The point is not closing the jails on Rikers Island, it's closing it's the process, and that was an error, I think, the department, I hope, realizes in terms of the closing of GMDC. Just for, for additional context, the, the three facilities um, mentioned in testimony, NIC facility, West facility, <laughs> and um, Rosie's, are the facilities with the highest production rates, um, but they also together represent less than 10% of the average daily population, so I think, um, to Dr. Cohen's point, the size of the facility does matter. Got it. Thank you. And and one of the things that they uh, uh, I think was CHS noted was that even though you might miss it on a certain day, you got, you'll get rescheduled and you will you'll make your you will make your appointment if you choose to, uh, or there will be an effort to. I, I, can you tell us any information about the efforts or the tracking that y you may have around that process happening? Rescheduled is captured outside in a different category. Right. So yeah, I noticed that too. So I'm not sure what they mean by missed, so the appointments that we are calling missed, and which actually they call missed in their report, do not include rescheduled appointments, which is a separate part of the report. So I'm not sure. I, I, we had that conversation. I think that the, well, let's let's go to, they had mentioned that, um, well, if you are, um, if you, I think it was about the undocumented refusals and then the ability that you could then be rescheduled later on, or maybe you could talk yeah. about the undocumented, your any experience or, uh, so around the undocumented mm -hmm. refusals. So um, I believe um, Ross was saying that for everybody that's not produced by DOC, there's a review and then a rescheduling of the people that ultimately miss their appointment due to non-production. Um, and we do not know, so one of the limitations of our access report is that we don't know the initial time of um, an appointment is first scheduled. So we don't know how many attempts so we just know completion or non-completion. Right, right, right. We don't know how many attempts were made um, um, from the first scheduling of appointment, and that is one of the areas that we're going to be working on in terms of getting better metrics and um, improving our understanding of timeliness of um, scheduling to actual um, uh, time individuals are actually seen. Is there information that um, that the board would like to see reported more thoroughly or efficiently? Um, yes. So in addition to the sick call um, efforts that this new bill presents, which we fully support, um, there are um, metrics around intake, in particular to your question about the 24 hours and, and around that timing that we would like to see included in the access report 
Um, again, additional metrics about um, how many attempts it's taking for scheduled services um, to actually be completed, um, so other timeliness metrics. And then um, we have been waiting for quite some time for metrics on substance use um, care treatment services to be included in the access report. Um, and um, we'll be pushing to get those included in the reports as well. And Good. we also do want to include the reasons for non-production. Got it. And have you requested them to report that to you? You have re the failures for non-production? Yes. Um, when the report was released publicly in May at the public board meeting, um, we encouraged um, both DOC and Correctional Health to make a public commitment to do joint tracking so that that information could be included in the reports. And did they, what was their response? Um, their response at the meeting was that they track different things and their tracking is separate. Got it. Thanks. Um, uh, my final question, uh, you, I think, Dr. Cohen, I think you mentioned some of the positive aspects here of the changeover from Corizon to H&H. &H. Can you share some of, with us some of the aspects of correctional health care that have seen the most improvement and talk about some of the progress that's been made? Um, obviously, we, 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 I think we've heard, we, but we're happy to hear more that also need fixing or monitoring, yeah. but can you share with us some of the positive aspects um, that you feel have been improved upon in the last two years? Right, and, and I will be re-quoting things that were said, but I think they're worth, they're worth emphasizing. The improvement in the, in, the serious, in the mental health services for seriously mentally Ill, Ill people has been terrific. And that happened some before, but it's this group of people who have made it happen, and they're expanding it substantially. Um, that needs to be further expanded. There are things called PACE and CAPS units, but there are also things called mental observation, which are not impressive and need to be, and need to be supported. Um, but I know that I, I know I believe everyone is committed to that, and, but overall that's been a very positive area. More to be done. I think we're talking about seriously mentally ill people. We're not talking just about the M designation mm -hmm. on Rikers Island, but there are a lot of seriously mentally ill people who need really enhanced um, mental health services with, in, with enhanced sec su support from security. Um, the, uh, uh, the opiate wor work, work that the, um, you know, that, that's been done is terrific, uh, expanding buprenorphine and methadone services and get, making sure that everybody who's coming in who's on methadone um, is maintained on methadone rather than having most of them uh, uh, kicked off is a, is a tremendous, that's a CHS, um, uh, you know, an accomplishment which I'm very, I'm very proud of and it, it, just, it demonstrated that, you know, large numbers of people, I think it's like 40 to 60 percent of people who would not have been allowed to continue with their methadone um, because they were thought they were going to be going upstate aren't. So lots and lots of people going on to Rikers Island don't go upstate and we should keep that in mind when we think about other issues of, of decreasing this population. Uh, so mental health, um, o opiates, and I think the, um, you know, I think that the, uh, the quality of, uh, of professional staffing uh, is also something which has been mentioned here and which I'm, which I'm very, very proud of as well. Right. And just, sorry, one last question. I think you mentioned the uniqueness of New York City versus other places in terms of our separation, in terms of um, the, the having two different agencies involved in this process. Are there other cities or states that you know that have something similar to that? There, there are a few, um, and, those are, and those are among the best uh, si situations. I mean, it's true in Chicago, and it has been true there for, uh, for, for a long time. Um, it is now getting true in LA. I don't think it was true before. Um, there's still substantial parts of the LA system which are under DOC, but, but a lot of the medical programs have been moved out in, 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 in LA. So there are some other places that do it, but in general, having medical services are run by the health authority of a, of a, of a, of a county or a city or a state and, and, and security services provided by the Department of Correction is, I think, the, the best way to, uh, to deal with all the kinds of issues we've been talking about. Thank you. Thank you for uh, testifying, answering the questions, and of course, providing the reports and the material that also helps the committee get a better understanding. And I think together between us and the BOC and the DOC and CHS will have a shared mission here, making sure people get quality access and when they need it. Um, and uh, But I think a lot of this, this conversation and the information and reports that the BOC has done have helped us you know, understand the, uh, the better. So thank you for your, both your advocacy and your reporting. Um, other questions? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, do you think there's anything that we can include in that report that will help us ascertain better mm -hmm. outcomes in, in terms of what I mentioned uh, during the beginning of the hearing? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yes, I think um, the additional metrics that, that we've been um, focused on and prioritizing for inclusion um, around um, intake, um, timeliness of access to care, and then the substance use um, um, services, information on substance use services and outcomes. Um, and also some just basic information about screening, like how many people are screening with a disability, how many people are screening with a mental health need at intake, um, or screening with a substance use care need. So without knowing how many people are screening to begin with, um, it's sort of hard to interpret these numbers of people who are receiving care, like is that actually um, the full population in need? So having those baseline screening um, intake numbers are important there as well. And on my and last oh, just, oh, just an, an addition yeah. is the reasons for refusal. We need to have a very clear set of set of uh, set, set of reasons that everybody agrees to, and then that we can then analyze uh, produ pr 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 productively. And these are going to include, uh, you know, in, for example, uh, you know, th there are a lot of lockdowns on, on you know in, in, in the facilities, and that number has increased mm -hmm. over time, and that affects it. So, yeah. So clear, re clearly defined reasons for non-production, and clearly defined reasons for patient refusals. And, and I'll ask this of the advocates. We'll, hopefully we'll hear from the advocates, and I want to thank you all for waiting and uh, considering the weather outside. Um, had they mentioned the, I'm going to call them walk-ins, for lack of a better word, people that do not sign up for sick call that can show up and receive services. Do you feel, um, have you heard of any issues with, with these particular incarcerated individuals? They made it seem like it was very easy in practice to show up and receive yeah. medical attention. I'm not aware of this. I, I, I did hear today about, you know, there's the law library is close to one clinic and there's, a, there's sort of a back door between the law library and the clinic, but generally I don't think that, that that's not how it goes. Um, so uh, A high percentage of fil facilities are escort only facilities. So the only way someone would be permitted to get from their housing area to the clinic would be via an escort. Okay, thank you. I, th I think that, just to clarify, I think the issue was about people who don't sign up but want yeah, access they don't to officially call. sign up. Yeah. They can say, I want to go. Our standards yeah. require that. They I mean, we require that there be emergency access to care. Uh, and so, you know, that was called, um, um, that, that really is a different category than signing up for, for sickle. I'm glad, you know, if that happens, but, that, but those numbers are not, the, are not really what we're talking about. Would you be able to tell me what happens with an individual with a, a mental illness who should be taking medication but is refusing to take medication? How is that addressed? Yeah, that's probably better done by them. I believe that there is a policy which says uh, if you miss a certain number of doses that are, you know, which is, I forget what it is. Someone here, they're, they're not here right now. You know, it's probably two or three days of medication. All, med all psychiatric medications are, deli are given directly, with, through directly insert therapy. So they don't have bottles in their cells. They have to go to, the, to, a, to a pharmacy area. 99% um, of medications are administered. When the department wants to do something and CHS wants to, they can. So almost everybody um, who's, or, who's prescribed medication gets it every day. But and, and if you refuse it if you don't, or don't show up, then, the, then there's a requirement that the, the medical staff r bring you to the clinic to discuss what the problem with your medication is. Understood. Thank you. Uh, well, I had one last question, actually, we didn't, which we didn't discuss. If you're in punitive segregation, does that disconnect you from any necessary uh, treatment, appointments, sick call, or anything that you might re need or require? No, I don't, I don't think so. You know, you know what it is. I, I don't believe it is. I mean, there are medical... Uh, me medical staff visit punitive segregation every day to ask for um, if people have any uh, new medical problems. All medications are distributed within uh, within punitive segregation, and this isn't something that I follow closely, and I'm not aware of uh, of problems with, uh, with with access to, to to medical care there right now. But it requires people going every day to visit with those people. Okay. Somebody from the CHS. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. Thank, thank you Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Next up, we are going to have a panel of because it is snowing out and because of time, and and uh, we are going to I think ask for uh, two minutes apiece. Um, we have 
uh, is it Mick Kincaid, Sylvia Rivera Law Project. I'm sorry if I got that name wrong. Uh, we have Deanna King, Drug Deanna King Drug Policy Alliance, and Jennifer Parrish from the Urban Justice Center. Thank you, and I think we're gonna, and I know that some of you have testimony that's probably beyond the two minutes, so we'll ask you, I'm, and I, I appreciate you waiting. Um, it is, I think, there's snowing out, and so we wanna get some people home, but um, but we really wanna hear your point, so, um, you know, we'll get, that, and it's all on the records. Um, so, uh, and then we'll have a, a series of questions, too. So if we'll start left to right, that's what works. My left, my, sir, my left, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, just if you don't mind, say your name, your, your organization, and then um, you can begin testifying. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I'm Mick Kincaid, and you pronounced it perfectly. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm with the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. I'm the director of the Prisoner Justice Project. I'm one of their staff attorneys. I had planned to read, but that's not gonna be in two minutes, but <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so thank you for the invitation to testify. Um, on this issue of healthcare and correctional settings. Uh, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project is one of the oldest nonprofits in New York City offering legal services to transgender, gender nonconforming, and intersex people by transgender, gender nonconforming, and intersex people. We often use the acronym TGNCI or TGNC. Um, so we specifically work on those issues. That's what I'm gonna be testifying about. My te written testimony is specific to the written policy for transgender healthcare, but since the other testimony has happened, I made a short list of all the other things I should have said. Um, but uh, as a bit of background, um, I have personally worked with over 100 TGNCI individuals in the New York City Department of Corrections in the past four to five years. Um, I go twice a month to the Transgender Housing Unit and I teach a um, legal and cultural programming class. So that was, um, that's been since August 2015 um, and that's continued now that the Transgender Housing Unit has moved to Rose. Um, an uh, overview of healthcare operations um, is, is that uh, there's only one policy, it's, um, number, it's MED 24B, which is the policy on transgender healthcare that was last updated in July 2015. It is a policy which uh, relies on very outdated practices. Um, as a general overview, TGNC people uh, require the same care as our cisgender uh, counterparts, but in addition, some of us need care specific to our transitions. Transitions are highly individualized and they require individualized care. Um, that's probably true for any kind of medical care. Um, every TGNC person's experience of gender dysphoria and the steps that we must take to thrive with that dysphoria are different. Um, there can be no cookie cutter approach. Um, as I just said, that's probably true for almost every type of healthcare. Um, transitionally related care can range from knowledgeable counseling to hormone replacement therapy. Oh my God, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> um, which is HRT and various types of surgeries. Uh, the existing policy only allows for one type of medical care, and it says in the purpose of it um, that it will minimize the use of non-standard or high-dose regimes, which may be appropriate under the direct supervision of expert community providers, but may also confer undue risk in the gel environment. It brings everything down to three milligrams of estradiol for uh, feminizing hormones and 25 milligrams of spironolactone um, and 200 milligrams of testosterone. Um, these are against all the clinical uh, updated clinical standards for best practices. Um, and in particular, it's very uh, upsetting for transgender women. It's such a low, low dose of spironolactone, which should be up to 200 milligrams as opposed to 25 milligrams, um, means that you're not blocking testosterone, which means that all of the effects of the estradiol are wiped out completely. There's no um, effect of the feminizing hormone, which means that if, if everyone who goes into the prison system gets cut down to that specifically, that basically means there's no point in having them on estrogen at all. Um, so this is not acceptable. It's a really horrific practice. There's no reason to have, have um, no specialists in the city center when, if you are at MDC, there's Apicha's Community Healthcare Center is literally five blocks away. There's so many transgender healthcare specialists in the city. 
this needs to be addressed and this needs to be updated. Great, thank you. We'll do the panel, then we'll ask all the questions after that. Thanks so much. Just introduce yourself as well. Sure. Um, my name is Deanna King. I'm with the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, we are the nation's leading organization working to advance policies and attitudes that best reduce the harms of both drug use and drug prohibition. I too wrote a testimony, but I will keep it short. Um, so this is the second day. Uh, we've been talking about methadone and buprenorphine access in correctional facilities. Um, as advocates, we do um, work closely with the KEEP program. We, we uh, lift it up as a model that New York State uh, should um, emulate um, and make those same medications accessible statewide. Um, we do sort of struggle um, externally with the lack of data about that program as it relates to programmatic outcomes, uh, referral services, uh, what does a warm handoff look like, what are reentry services provided. So it's difficult to present like what a, a robust testimony with the limited amount of information that is made public to the uh, to those outside. Um, the most recent um, report about um, the services there was done in 2001, I think that's the one that's most accessible, and it talks about Medicaid services um, being necessary um, for them to promote a warm handoff, but we need better information about why this works. We need it for our state advocacy as well, um, so if you guys are pushing to make that data more transparent, it would be of service to us. Uh, another thing that we want to lift up, and I think um, the DLC is taking this on is just improving reentry services. Um, as it stands now, it seems as if people are getting referred to treatment facilities to return to, but this is a high need for a vulnerable population. They need a warm handoff. We need someone uh, with them at the front line, taking them to directly to treatment services, taking them directly to harm reduction services to make sure that people stay um, in their program. And right now, that doesn't seem to be happening as efficiently as it should. Um, I think Portion Society is going to step in to help fill that gap, but other agencies, specifically harm reduction service providers that aren't li really listed in um, treatment protocols and reentry services, need to be part of that process because not everyone's going to return to an abstinent based facility. We need to integrate harm reduction services uh, into Rikers in a real way. Um, the third thing I want to lift up is what your resolution would do um, promote access statewide. Um, not everyone is going to return back to their communities, unfortunately, um, after being in, detained for a period in Rikers. And once you leave that facility, you're going to go statewide where there's no access to any of the services that are afforded there. Um, and DOCS does not seem to be moving in any kind of rapid, um, rapidly to, to fill this gap. And we also need to make sure that whatever DOCS does mirrors what DOC is doing, that all three forms of medication are provided in that space and not just Vivitrol, which is what we see happening now. So everything else is in my testimony and I will pass it to my friend here. Okay. Hi, my name is Jennifer Parrish. I'm the Director of Criminal Justice Advocacy at the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project. Um, we represent the Brad H. class, which is basically everyone who's receiving mental health treatment in the city jails. Um, there's a settlement agreement which the city entered into in 2003, which requires them to provide discharge planning services to people. Um, I think that you know, since then, services have certainly improved, and correctional health services has made fundamental improvements to service delivery, but they still remain non-compliant with key discharge planning services. And I've included in my testimony a couple of charts at the end that show you kind of overall um, where they're non-compliant. So the failure to provide initial mental health assessments, comprehensive treatment plans, and discharge plans in a timely manner can result in class members being released from the jails without the vital services. Um, when they incorrectly um, diagnose a person, um, whether they have a serious mental illness or not, that affects the level of services that people are entitled to in discharge planning. There are many more services available to people who have that SMI designation as opposed to people who just ha have a mental health need. <laughs> So they need to get that diagnosis correct. Um, also providing individualized appropriate treatment referrals, supportive housing assistance, and case management services is central to ensuring that class members can successfully transition from jail to community. Yet CHS's compliance with these performance measures, although improved, remains well below expectations. Providing these services requires communication with past treatment providers as well as coordination with the services that they're referring people to. Um, in addition, um, Department of Correction has a role in d providing discharge planning services, and I'm, 
I think you saw a display here of how little they think of their role in uh, correctional health services generally. They cert certainly weren't re prepared to answer your questions, and I think that reflects their overall commitment to the health of people. Uh, but specifically, sorry, just specifically related to people um, s discharge planning is that they have to produce um, individuals for these appointments with mental health and social work. They also have to transmit information about who's been released to HRA to make sure that their Medicaid gets turned on correctly. They have failed to do that sometimes, and when the court-appointed monitors and Brad H. ask about that, they say, well, we fixed it, but we have no way to check on the quality of that going forward. Um, it's completely unacceptable. And also, they're charged with releasing people during daylight hours, and for people who are in on alleged parole violations, they frequently fail to do so. So the rest of our specific recommendations are included in our written testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. Is there any reason, any concern that TGNG uh, transgender uh, non-conforming individuals are not self-reporting about medical needs to DOC um, or CHS because of fear for their safety within the correctional facilities? And are there adequate protections in place um, for them now? That's a great question. Absolutely. Um, so uh, uh, th there's a range of answers to that. Um, I have worked with a number of transgender women. Um, who have remained what's often called stealth throughout their entire time inside. They have not reported themselves as being trans to anyone. Um, and as such, they have not gone on their hormones because they um, are so worried that any access to care will out them. Um, these are women who are in the women's facilities. Um, and so, <laughs> and, and they were very concerned that if they were outed as transgender, they'd be moved to the men's facilities. Um, the council might already know that under the Prison Rape Elimination Act, you're supposed to be doing an interview with people, you're supposed to be strongly considering their idea of health care, you're supposed to be under the Department of Justice's interpretation of it, you're supposed to be uh, defaulting to placing people as they identify, unless there's a, uh, a they, they don't request it, which often happens for transgender men, or if um, there's a reason unrelated to their gender identity and another person's perception of it to house them as how they identify. The, the department doesn't do that. Um, almost everyone gets housed according to the birth they were assigned at sex the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, and so they, um, uh, yeah, great. So there's a lot of reasons why they, folks don't come forward. In addition, it, so if you're a transgender woman, for instance, you're already automatically housed in a men's facility. If you think that you can get through that uh, housing situation safer by never coming out as trans, most people are going to do that, yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. So do you ever, in terms of, we continue to ask why Why aren't people produced at their appointments? And I know that there's a ton of reasons. Um, yeah, you do, I see in your testimony, and I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to read all of it, and, and it looks extremely comprehensive, and I will after the hearing. Do you, can you concisely say how DOC and H&H &H can improve access to and delivery of care? I know it can be a long answer, but if you could kind of just hit on a, a couple of the most important points you think. Um, well, for one thing, they could start being accountable for what's actually happening. I mean, they almost said that there was no problem with escorts, um, which we know that there is. Um, frequently, when we're in the jail seeing people, we see that you know someone who's been assigned a particular post gets reassigned. Um, the jails are chaotic, and um, all of a sudden, there's no person to do that job, and people don't get seen. I mean, I certainly can't say all of the reasons that it happens, but I think that they should be documenting those reasons and being able to report to the council on that. Um, I certainly think there's an obligation on CHS as well, but I think you saw that DOC um, really couldn't for come forward with any answers about it. Um, I think <coughs> overall, um, I mean, I think that, you know, the Nunez Monitor's report came out recently that shows that um, the jails continue to be an incredibly brutal place, um, that the use of force is still incredibly high. Um, that has an impact on the way healthcare is provided and all other services as well. So I think Thank it's you. a complex one. Thank you. 
I would also say just streamlining it so that it's only through HHC that, that the sick calls are made. Um, in particular, when you're talking about vulnerable populations, anyone who has um, an illness or a concern that they don't want the general population to know about, having it go through the officers outs them completely. Um, whether that's just through people talking or whether that's through the officers checking in with them and then like escalating up to the captain, why didn't you come, why didn't you come in front of everyone, that's a real invasion of people's medical privacy. And as far as discharge planning is concerned, uh, to my knowledge, people are giving information about where to go in the community uh, once they return home, but that in that time frame, that's a particularly vulnerable period, and that's when you're most susceptible to fatal overdose if you relapse. So you need someone there to support you in that transition point to get you directly to the place where you can have your next appointment if that's methadone or buprenorphine, or to take home medication with you just to fill that gap. I think transitional services need to be uh, really more detailed uh, and really more person-centered and really to integrate harm reduction into that practice so someone has real support in coming home and that can be done through peer programs. Um, we would suggest that it be done through peer programs with someone who would, with direct experience in both uh, substance use and um, navigating um, integration as a formerly incarcerated person. And do you think that all that being said that an incarcerated individual knows when they should declare whatever they're feeling or whatever's going on with them in emergency versus when they should go to sick call? Do you think that they have that information as soon as they're um, assessed? So for example, if, if um, when someone, I described some of the people that had been untreated and who had passed away. So do you think that when the assessment when as soon as they get in, that they are given that information like, hey, like you know that when you're not feeling well and when it's an emergency, like versus 911 versus making an appointment with the doctor. Do you feel like that sort of education or that information is given to the people there, considering some of their either their medical conditions or what they're going through or the medications that they're taking, based on your experience and talking with some of the people? I think there could certainly be more communication for people about how they access services, but I think probably the bigger problem is that when they make those complaints to the officers on the housing area, they're ignored. Um, and we know that in the past, I mean certainly under the previous provider, that there are people who died because the correction officers didn't recognize how um, in need they were. So um, I think yes, there can be education and that will help people be able to access that, but I think it also has to be um, ingrained in the correctional staff that this is a priority and when someone makes that complaint, we make sure that they get there. Thank you, and, and I'd, we'd be happy just because we you had less time, but we'd certainly be happy to do a follow-up conversation or meeting on any issues as well. I know a lot of, I think the others as well. <laughs> and we'll um, take your recommendations and if we have questions, follow up with them as well. Thank you, thank you for the, your patience as well. Um, next up, we are gonna have Julia Solomons from the Bronx Defenders, Julia McCarthy from the Prisoners' Rights Project at Legal Aid Society, and Brooklyn Defender Services, Brooke Menchel. Doing okay with names. Everyone could raise your right hand, please. Oh, they don't. You're right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So we'll uh, we'll start and go this way, uh, and we'll same thing. We'll have a clock. If you're if you're making finishing comments, obviously you can keep going, and then we'll ask some questions. So thanks, thanks, and thank you for your patience. My name is Brooke Menchel. I'm the Civil Rights Counsel at the Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you for the opportunity to address this group today. Correctional health care in city jails cannot be viewed in a vacuum. Instead, part, it's part of a continuum of care that starts long before people enter the criminal justice system and extends far beyond their discharge. 
the lack of access of care that the people we represent often face is itself the cause, a cause that often leads to incarceration or problematic behavior, and that lack of access further does nothing to improve the security of our communities. Decarceration, while investing in healthy communities, will ultimately result in safer, healthier society that will benefit both the people we represent as well as the community at large. The people we represent are frequently hamstrung in, in their attempts to access care by distinct but interconnected issues. First, many DOC practices, ostensibly in the interest of security, often come at the expense of care for clients and needs. Second, physical design and staffing allocations often impede clients' ability to readily access treatment that they require. And third, administrative hurdles frequently hamper our clients' attempts to access indicated mental health or medical care. Access to care can be a linchpin to improving security. Contrary to an assertion we frequently hear that there is tension between security and care, robust accessible medical care is necessary to ensuring safe, healthy, and secure communities and correctional facilities. Too often, correctional staff without requisite knowledge or training take it upon themselves to block access to care. The result is significant harm to the well-being of the people we represent. Today, we've heard a lot about sick call and refusals. Unfortunately, the experience that was portrayed to you in the earliest panel is not the experience of the people we represent. We have many examples that I'd be happy to share, either now or at some later point, but the reality for many of our clients is despite frequent attempts and requests to access sick call or access medical care, they are unfortunately blocked from doing so. And we support increased transparency and accountability in the system um, and urge the council to adopt the w intro 1236 to ensure that necessary data collection and reporting. The other point I would like to just quickly make would be that the, the system regularly denies access to particular programs or treatment because of high security classifications or infractions. And that's a regular problem for our clients that has long lasting and problematic results. Um, and we would also, su we also support the resolution 581 to improve access around, uh, access to those programs. So the impediments are too clearly too many to name today, but we've attempted to outline both here and in, in the written testimony major hurdles that the people we represent face on a daily basis. We'd set, we echo the sentiments of the other organizations and um, appreciate the council's efforts to improve the health and safety of our communities, both in correctional facilities and before and after uh, time that's spent there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Same thing, we'll do the panel and then we'll yep. ask all questions. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Julia McCarthy. I'm here for the, from the Prisoner's Rights Project of the Legal Aid Society. Um, I'm a paralegal case handler and speak with upwards of um, 200 people each month who are incarcerated and hear about all types of issues facing those in custody. The vast majority of the calls we field are about medical care in city jails. Um, in contrast to the testimony we heard from DOC today, the Department of Corrections' failure to provide sick call seems to be a pervasive problem across city jails. Whether an individual is spitting up blood or attempting to renew a prescription, we receive reports of people being denied sick call on a regular basis. Last month, several incarcerated people from the same housing area in one city jail organized to reach out to us, sharing their experiences of not having access to sick call. These individuals reported that they informed multiple officers, captains, and deputies about the lack of access to services, but nothing changed. They told us that often the only course of action that seemed to work was calling 311. Um, there are plenty of reasons that can contribute to lack of access to sick call. Um, as s stated previously, many incarcerated people tell us that officers seem to be acting as gatekeepers when it comes to getting d deciding who gets access to sick call. Um, all the decisions regarding need for medical attention shall be made by health care personnel that comes directly from the minimum standards. Um, this sec section exists for a very good reason. Correction officers are not medical staff and are not equipped to make medical assessments. We also hear reports of retaliation with clients reporting to us that they're not being called for sick call and they're being singled out because they've reported DOC misconduct in the past. We also often hear reports of clients telling us they were marked as a refusal despite never refusing care. 
Another common refrain from our clients is an apparent staffing issue. Officers tell them that their housing area cannot attend certain services because there's simply not enough staff to take them. This problem is pervasive and not just in assigned housing areas. Clients tell us about waiting for hours or days in intake areas before being brought to sick call, even if they are visibly in need of medical care. Several incarcerated people have reported to us that after being assaulted, they will wait in intake areas for several hours while profusely bleeding before seeing medical staff. We also regularly he hear from clients that they cannot get adequate treatment for serious medical problems. Um, a legal aid paralegal saw bleeding, uh, visible rods protruding from one of the client's legs um, at one of the council visits and said that the wounds looked infected. Our client reported that the pain he was experiencing was so extreme many days he was unable to walk. He repeatedly attempted to access a cane to help him ambulate but was told by medical staff that a specialist would need to prescribe this device to him. They then did not schedule an appointment for him, for him and he never received a cane. Um, so we receive reports of this on a daily basis um, and hopefully we would like to see some reform in terms of access to serious medical treatment and access to daily sick call. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter. Uh, my name is Julia Solomons. I'm a social worker in the criminal defense practice uh, with the Bronx Defenders. Um, as a social worker in our criminal defense practice, my role often involves providing extra support and advocacy to clients who are incarcerated, many of whom are battling physical or mental health challenges, drug and alcohol addiction, or some combination thereof. Um, our clients often speak of the delay they experience between their initial arrest and the first time they see a doctor at Rikers Island. The process of being arrested, processed through central bookings, arraigned, and transported to Rikers Island alone can take up to 36 hours. Um, once they arrive on the island, they begin an intake process that takes several days. This means that now this person has likely been without medical attention and at times critical medication for four to five days. Five days without medication can be a matter of life and death and unfortunately, we have witnessed the gravity of this delay firsthand, resulting in consequences as grave as death. Even more alarming, however, is that even once clients have seen a doctor three or four times, they still report receiving inadequate care. I wanna share one example of a client, Kevin. Kevin is a young man, but has experienced more trauma and suffering than many of us will experience in our lifetimes. After facing a great deal of loss, Kevin found himself turning to opiates to numb the pain. His heroin habit eventually cost him his physical health, first with, diag first with diagnoses of several chronic health conditions, and ultimately, Kevin's heart became severely compromised. As a result, he began taking several cardiac and blood pressure medications to support his cardiovascular functioning. Um, despite efforts by our staff and Kevin's own advocacy to receive these medications through correctional health, um, after speaking with him, after two weeks of being on Rikers Island, he was still not receiving any of the necessary, these necessary um, heart medications. This is a problem we see often that clients with serious health issues communicate their condition to doctors on Rikers Island, but doctors may not act on information they receive from clients' reports alone, waiting to receive documentation to validate those self-reported needs. Um, I just want to share one other example of Ron, um, who was a client that signed up on several occasions for sick call to be um, produced to uh, correctional health and followed the protocol repeatedly, but no officer was ever made available to escort him. He had chronic knee issues that went unaddressed for weeks as a result of this, um, and I believe this illustrates um, gaps in collaboration between correctional health and um, the Department of Corrections, as we've heard today. Um, <clears throat> We find encouraging that the, these committees are taking this issue seriously, and um, we would welcome the creation of some type of system that would allow inmates and their advocates to submit complaints when they're not receiving adequate health care. Um, these complaints could be tracked and managed, and it would help to identify patterns and recurrent gaps in care, which would help to uphold our clients' right to access adequate health care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on your last point about a system for making complaints, um, what would that look like? Is, is 311 not adequate for that today? Um, and to all folks on the panel, um, just in, talk, in terms of talking about 311, it came up earlier uh, about why somebody might use that as a way to um, talk about medical care and need for medical care versus other other available methods. Can you tell us any experience on that as well in terms of why you're hearing folks are using that as a, as a, as a way to file a complaint or make a, make a call for a need for health care? So 
So on your last question about 311, one of the things that I think we hear frequently is just the amount of time it takes. So if somebody has signed up for sick call, made an effort to go through what they believe to be the appropriate mechanisms, and then they call 311, they still haven't gotten care, we may hear about it through our office, and then we might decide to get involved often by doing direct advocacy with DOC and the Board of Correction, and only then, seemingly as a result of our involvement, do they actually get the care. So those particular people, then the next time around, just aren't going to bother, and they will come to us and say, oh, I only get care when you get involved. I would echo that same point. I've had several clients report that um, they only receive care once I've sent an email um, to Correctional Health requesting that they be seen. Um, and I think something that I would like to see is um, just sort of what happens on the back end when we make those requests and some sort of tracking mechanism to you know, how often action is taken as a result of, of those interventions. Um, thanks, and, and I think two of the testimonies talked about, and they're written, I think, more than you got an opportunity to talk about it, but I want to bring it up, is the gatekeeper status here of staff. Can you tell us more about what you're seeing? Is it documented, measured in any way? It sounds like someone's anecdotal. Um, but the idea that the non-production uh, uh, um, is is a result of it could be punitive or something else. Can you talk to us more about what those instances that you're referring to are and other other um, efforts to document them or to raise them in a more systematic manner? I think one of the things that we hear often is that um, even though housing areas are supposed to have a sign-up sheet, there is no sign-up sheet. So then it sort of becomes a free-for-all the following day when sick call is called by the officers and officers are seemingly making just random decisions about who gets access to care. Um, frequently people will say they sign up multiple days in a row before they get access, or if they are somebody who is known by the officers just for signing up a lot, they feel as if they're not getting the treatment they require even though they're going through the procedures that are laid out by DOC. So it's a combination of just the housing areas not following the procedures that they have laid out for incarcerated people to follow, and also just people sort of using a variety of methods to obtain treatment and nothing is working. Um, and, and can I ask a follow-up question? Is that, does, uh, are, is the belief that it's punitive or it is a staffing issue or it is a, um, a failure somewhere in the system? Is somebody, you know, there, there's a day somebody doesn't do the sick call and uh, what is the what is the belief in terms of what that actually uh, why the motivation for that or the reason for that? I think it's a combination of things, but largely staffing. We've heard a lot recently in the last couple of months just n absolutely no access to sick call multiple days in a row. Staffing meaning they're not doing their job. I mean they're not you no, know performing no that escorts. function of their job or that or the lack of lack uh, of escorts to provide housing areas with access to the clinic. Mm -hmm. And I think in addition it is. I agree with that. I think there are a lot of problems that we hear about with, with escort access and availability, but we also hear a lot about retaliatory or punitive decisions. We had a client who, um, who re had re complained about treatment from correctional officers and then needed sick call because of a cut on his arm, arm or leg, I'm not exactly sure. but signed up repeatedly and was just told, no, you can't, no, we're not gonna take you, and over and over and over again, and ultimately developed gangrene and almost had to have the limb amputated. So I think it is both staffing allocations as well as, um, as, well as retaliation or punishment. And to your question earlier about the frequency and kind of the systematized way of raising it, this is one of, if not the most frequent problem that we hear around medical care is just the idea that people can't actually even access the medical care in the first instance. Um, so that's a very, very real problem for our clients. And I think we are trying to raise it in a helpful way with you in, converse, in ongoing conversations with the Board of Correction and, and with DOC, but we're certainly open to any additional conversations or suggestions about how we can be more helpful on this point. And the, and I think one solution would be to have CHS 
participate if that's one of the issues to participate and see that information as well so we know that there's not gatekeeping happening if that is what's happening. Um, the, um, um, but ha more systematically, how do, we, how do we uncover if that is the case where folks are receiving sick call slips and not, not delivering them or punitive, are there other measures that one that I would recommend to to take that discretionary part out of the process or the punitive part out of the process. I don't have a specific recommendation, but I do think the point made about um, clients refusing sick call. I think anything that can be done to sort of um, promote greater sort of accountability about what that refusal looked like, the signature piece that was mentioned earlier, requiring a signature if a client refuses um, their, their escort to the clinic, because I think we do hear frequently, we, we were told that a client refused and the client reports that they did not in fact refuse. So knowing when that's a real refusal and, and when it's not, I think would so be. So with documentation well. of all uh, as many kind of issues. And I think also parsing out the types of refusals as uh, was discussed during the Board of Correction panel is a helpful step. Uh, and we're certainly would be interested in that. And I also think that having accountability within DOC, I mean, we heard at the earliest panel um, the, the perception of, oh, our clients decide not to go, or it's just they don't feel like it, they don't feel like waiting. The people we hear from are often desperate for medical care. And so having a situation where we're hearing people say, oh, it's all the client's fault is really, really problematic. And if that's coming down from the top level, when an officer is found to have claimed that a person refuses access to medical care, that, per that officer should be disciplined, should be trained. There should be steps taken in that instance so that it doesn't ultimately come back around to it being the, the individual's fault who's trying to get the requisite care. Yeah, sure. And, and, and I, I recognize that there are instances where people would say, I have confidence and I'm okay. And we, we wouldn't receive, you, you or I probably would not receive a call from that person because it was optional. Um, but but I, I understand the, uh, uh, the other categories involved. Um, I, that was my other, any questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oops, sorry, I had a live feed. I didn't even notice. So this question might you might not be able to answer, but just out of curiosity, um, would you know if the uh, the transgender housing unit gives access to medicated assisted treatment to individuals that are housed there? I mean, we've because we've heard at previous hearings that the THV uh, doesn't offer methadone, and that the so a person has to choose between receiving either methadone or the THV. So yeah, so. I don't know if that has changed as of right now. I believe in our written testimony, if not, we can follow up after this hearing, that there was at least, we've had clients who've expressed that as a problem of having to choose between types of care they require. I don't, um, off the top of my head, know whether it's specifically methadone, but there's often a problem with, for our clients when they are trying to be in the THU for real, very real reasons and needs, and they can't be because a particular other type of medical care that they need is not offered there. So we can look into and, and figure out if we have any recent um, reports of that specific instance, but it is an ongoing problem, not just for methadone, but for other types of care as well. Thank you, we appreciate that. Thank you, thanks for your testimony, thanks so much. So our, our last panel here, we have, um, I have Sade Dixon, all right? And I'm sorry if I got that wrong. And then Jordan Rosendahl from College and Community Fellowship. Thank you, and thank you for your patience and, uh, and, and for waiting through, and, and on hopefully not too bad weather when we, get, when we all get out of here. Um, thank you again, we have your testimony. We'll put you on the clock and we'll ask you questions, and we'll start from this direction, go that way, and then uh, I'll have an opportunity. And as we look through your testimony, we'll also ask some questions. So, thanks. 
Um, oh, you. wait, should I? Okay, you I guess. Go first? Yeah, I'll go okay. first. Um, so, oh, sorry. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Jordan Rosenthal, and I'm the Senior Associate of Policy and Advocacy at College and Community Fellowship, a nonprofit that partners with women with criminal convictions to help them earn their college degrees so that they, their families, and communities can thrive. I'm here today on behalf of a student in our program, Nequasia, who is in pretrial detention for the duration of her pregnancy and has lived through the trauma of being on Rikers and has been at the mercy of the correctional health system. These are her words. When I was arrested, I had no idea I was pregnant and didn't find out until I had already been held for a month. I had a high-risk pregnancy, which is by definition suggests that in order to have a healthy and successful pregnancy and delivery, extra care is needed. But that didn't stop docs from shackling me for the first six months of my pregnancy because of the nature of my crime. I had access to and was seen by an OBGYN, but wasn't given adequate care or monitoring. My prenatal care consisted of an extra snack and some milk. This is unacceptable when most women in jail are mothers and 5% are pregnant. I wish more than anything I could have advocated, advocated for better care for myself and my daughter, but I was consumed with my own legal case to do so. I was so desperate to have my case heard and have bail set that I hid the fact that I was in labor. I remember being transported to my bail hearing and trying so hard to swallow the pain and not bring attention to my contractions because I couldn't handle the thought of my hearing being rescheduled. When the judge saw me in the state I was in, he scolded the guards, sent me to the hospital to give birth, and then right back to detention. By the time I was able to have my bail hearing, I'd spent a total of 15 months in pretrial detention. Due to the nature of my crime, I was not allowed to stay in the nursery and bond with my baby girl. I suffered from postpartum depression and didn't see a psychiatrist until after I was sentenced when my child was already eight months old. During this time, we both suffered, and all of this happened before I even had my bail set. For the duration of my pregnancy and for months after, I was legally innocent, but I was treated as if I had been found guilty, stripped of my basic human rights and dignity. And the lack of care didn't just affect me, it affected my daughter, whose only crime was being my child. She is, um, I wanna thank Nequasia for graciously allowing us to share her story so no other woman and their child can endure, has to endure the pain and trauma suffered. As the city moves forward with closing Rikers and building smaller, safer borough-based facilities, I ask that you keep in mind the specific needs of women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Say Dixon. I am here representing I am here representing the Corrections Accountability Project at the Urban Justice Center. We are a nonprofit criminal justice advocate, advocacy organization committed to ending the financial exploitation of people involved in criminal legal system. I want to thank Chair Riviera, Chair Powers, and Chair Ayala, as well as the members of their committees for, for the opportunity to speak to you today. As a part of your joint oversee, oversight hearing on correctional health, I am here today to speak about my experiences accessing health care while incarcerated here in New York City. I spent eight months incarcerated at Rikers Island between 2012 and 2013. During this time, there were two instances that I required medical attention, with both, with, which both resulted in abuses and lack of care. In one case, during an extreme summer heat wave, I became physically ill and was never given the opportunity to visit medical staff. Temperatures that summer rose to 105, 105 degrees within the cinder blocks, walls of Rikers, with no fans or air conditioning to, to help with the heat. After days of li living in these conditions, I finally fainted from the heat exhaustion. I was discovered by correction officers who didn't even attempt to send me to the doctor and refused to give me water. Finally, a different correction officer finally gave me a water out of her own lunch bag, but I remained in my cell without any sort of medical attention, access to medical care, or, e or, or medical care when you really need it is entirely non-existent inside of Rikers. In another instance, my tooth was in, se in severe pain. I urgent, urgently required dental care, but, but, I, but I put in my multiple sick calls and talked to several correctional officers, but I wasn't seen by a dentist until two and a half weeks later. I was never given a reason for the delays, and when I did finally go to the dentist, I was treated with subpar care that would not have been tolerated outside of the jail. I would, have not been tr I would not have trusted them with 
with putting a needle in my mouth anyway, knowing what kind of medical treatment is given inside of jail. All of this happened while Corazon, a, a national correctional health care company based in Tennessee, managed health care on Rikers. During this period, Corazon was being sued on average every other national, nationally. But it is not surprising because their entire business model relies on treating people in jail at the lowest cost possible, which at times means not treating them at all. In 2015, New York City Health and Hospitals assumed control of health care in city jails, but this does not mean that medical abuses no longer occur or that the commercialization of the system and financial exploitation of people invo involved in involved no longer exists. Even if you manage to get access to the subpar medical attention on Rikers, you, are you and your loved ones may be forced to pay for treatment. Now, luckily, I had health care through my father, but most people are not as fortunate as me to be, covered, to be covered by their family and support networks, networks outside. The, they must cover the high co-pays themselves. People inside are penalized if they, if they have no one to pay and their commissary accounts are garnished by the city. I know people that this ha has happened to personally. Final, finally, I want to, finally, while not, while not a critical issue for me, I want to bring your attention briefly to abuses within correctional health care of pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical companies like Al Alchemez may make millions from selling opioid addiction treatments, medications like Viterol, to prisons and jails like Rikers. In fact, they make so much incarcerated people, they may, in fact, they make so much on incarcerated people that they are are an annual, annual corporate sponsor of the American Corrections Associations. I urge you to investigate, investigate the use of pharmaceuticals in, in New York City. Regardless of who is exploiting you, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, when you are in prison, you are nothing but a number. There is no quality of care because you do not have the same rights as someone's outside. You are treated like nothing, you are denied health care, you are abused medically, and you are exploited financially. The experience I mentioned are far from unique. Every day I heard from people about their inability to access health care and the courses they faced if they did. Going to jail is traumatic enough without worrying whether there will be anyone to care for you in the event of a medical emergency. Thank you for your time for listening to my testimony, and I look forward to seeing concrete solutions from the council that address exploitation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for the testimony. And I, I, um, uh, I, I note that we probably could spend even more time on the issue of, uh, of addiction and then also the pharmaceutical part of it. So I appreciate that, and it's something I think we want to would also want to be interested in, probably could take up a whole different type of hearing around that issue. And I think the council has spent some time recently thinking about op opioid addiction, mm -hmm. tr truthfully outside of the uh, outside of correction system. But obviously, there's a there's a there's a link, and and it's also an important issue. So appreciate that. Uh, I just want to also know. I, I don't think we receive written testimonies. So you want to submit or email? I can just submit. Okay, great. Yeah, um, she was actually planning on sharing it herself, oh, and okay. she didn't okay. know if she wanted to physically like hand it out. Um, I will ask her, and then I can send it around. Okay, it's on the record anyway. I just wanted yeah. to know. Okay. Okay. Um, did members have a question? Okay, thank you, and thank you for being here for the, thank the hearing. Thanks so much. Thank you. That is the end of the hearing. Thank you to everybody. Get home safe. I think there's a little bit of snow out there. I will get home. That's it? Yep. Thanks.